Yes, the Honorable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another important day of debate in our provincial legislature. Thanks to all those who are tuned in at home. I would like to take a moment to recognize a person who was visiting us today in the in the gallery, the public gallery, uh, Mr. Uh, Lorne Yeo. Uh, Lorne, uh, way back a long time ago when I was a journalist starting out, uh, Lorne was a night editor at the Guardian newspaper. And I learned an awful lot from Lorne. Uh, not much which was good for the paper business, but the rest which is really good for life. And, uh, and I uh, also uh, would say that uh, Lauren wrote me a lovely letter uh, about a year ago uh, following uh, some of the events that we were dealing with, and it's one of the ones I treasure I keep in my, in my uh, top drawer on my desk. So welcome, Lauren. I hope you enjoy the proceedings today. Uh, yesterday, Madam Speaker, I had the privilege to represent Prince Edward Island at the Simons Lecture Series uh, at the Confederation Center of the Arts and present the Simons Medal to Michael Ignatieff, <clears throat> one of the most esteemed, esteemed Canadians, uh, Madam Speaker, of our time. Uh, of course, his political career is well known to many, but uh, he, I would say, delivered a powerful presentation yesterday talking about the importance of hope in this difficult time, uh, it was very, very well received by those in attendance. It was a great, uh, it was a great message, and one we need to uh, not just listen to but heed. I think not just as elected officials, but uh, as Islanders and Canadians. So I want to congratulate Michael uh, and the members of the uh, committee at the Confederation Center of the Arts and the Simon's Lecture Series Committee uh, for organizing another first-class event. I also want to recognize, Madam Speaker, that. Uh, uh, the national uh, uh, women's soccer uh, is taking place in uh, Summerside, uh, hosted by Holland College. Uh, our Holland College team started off with a very strong 4-1 win yesterday and will advance to the semifinals uh, for the very first time. Uh, Kirsten Taylor scored two goals, and I wish the team good luck at 5 p.m. today, uh, fighting the fall elements in PEI uh, in early November, but doing a wonderful job, and uh, the attendance has been really, really strong, which we'd only come to expect with a sporting event uh, in the western capital of Summerside. I'd also want to say uh, that the western capital of Summerside and the city of Charlottetown, as we heard in here before, are hosting the World Under-17 Hockey Championships. Uh, it's a great event that's being very well attended by Islanders. This is something that's been in the works for a couple of years, but because of pandemics and other issues have been put off, but it's here, it's within us now, and it's a really, really exciting time. Uh, some of the greatest hockey players in the world that are under the age of 6, 17 are here and putting on a first-class show. The two Canadian teams, red and white, will meet in the quarterfinal game, uh, in, in, uh, I think today or tomorrow, uh, Madam Speaker. And, uh, I don't need to encourage Islanders to get out because the rinks have been full uh, all along. So thank you to the organizing committee, uh, our partners with the City of Charlottetown and the City of Summerside who are putting on a first-class event, and I've been hearing nothing but very, very positive uh, of, uh, reports from all who are attending. And with that, Madam Speaker, I wish you and all of our members in here today a productive session. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all those who are in our gallery. Welcome back, Lauren. Um, and also for those who are watching online from uh, their home, their office, or wherever it may be. Um, and especially those uh, tuning in from uh, Tignish Palmer Road. And while we're talking about Tignish Palmer Road, there's uh, two really significant anniversaries today I'd like to mention, and that's Ben and Lorraine Peters. Uh, we'll be celebrating their 55th uh, anniversary today. And also to... Um, Stafford and Eileen Gavin of Cal Pond, who uh, are celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary also today. So I, I would like to uh, congratulate them and wish them all the best uh, for another 55 uh, years of, of marital bliss. Um, I also want to um, mention to people that it's even last evening on the way home, there was a little bit of, of snow. We've seen it over the past week, so the temperatures are dropping to make sure you book your appointment to get your winter tires on. Um, that's something that I have to do, and I'm, I keep thinking of doing it when I'm on the way home, but nothing's open, so by uh, <laughs> the time I get home, I forget until I get back on the road again. But anyway, hopefully um, I will remember, and I'm just putting it out there to, uh, just to remind people that it's something that's very important to do, not only for their own safety, but for the safety of others on the road. i also like to congratulate um, all those who have had any... Um, 
dealings or organization to the committee also on the, the under 17 hockey that's taking place here on Prince Edward Island presently and wish uh, our teams all the best in their games today. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and hello to my colleagues and everyone tuning in from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, and around the island, and everyone joining us in the gallery today. Thank you for being here, and, um, and to our, our pages who are back today. Uh, yesterday was World Town Planning Day, and the PEI Institute of Professional Planners announced that the 2023 Murray Pinchuk Award has been awarded to bike-friendly communities for their work in making active transportation accessible and safe for all members of the community. The Community Builder Award recognizes the highest standard of community excellence in the public and private realms. It is presented every year on World Town Planning Day to an individual group or organization that has demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to making their PEI community a better place today and into the future in a way that touches on either the built or natural environment. So congratulations to Bike Friendly Communities for this and to the professional planners across PEI for the important work that they do. The PEI Museum and Heritage Foundation have announced the launch of Digital Voices Season 2 next Tuesday evening at Upstreet Craft Brewing. Um, this new season features eight videos and one, one essay about interesting islanders. Eric Wagner, Margie Carmichael Scott, McKenna Tarishi Ambassa, Hannah Gerrels, Michael Morrison, Sean Doak, Albert Arsenault, Christy Audita, and Leo Chevery. The foundation released Leo's video earlier, and it's a wonderful way to see Leo and remember his love of Eastern Kings and all of PEI. And I wish everyone a good day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to rise and say hello to um, everybody and watching from um, District 14. And uh, I hope you enjoy the proceedings today at home. And want to say hello to everybody in the gallery um, today, especially um, Michael Cameron. Um, it's great to see you today, here today, and um, a good friend of mine and, and someone that I think a lot about when I'm asking uh, these important questions in here, uh, Alan Spark. So thank you very much for coming in today and, and being part of this. Okay, short list today. Um, sorry, uh, Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, or sorry, Winslow. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I just want to uh, rise quickly and uh, note that the Special Olympics Annual Awards event uh, will be taking place tonight at 6.30 at the Florence Simmons uh, Performance Hall at Holland College. And on that note, uh, just a very uh, big congratulations to the organizers of Motion Ball. Uh, Motion Ball held, uh, took place about two weeks ago. It's a giant fundraiser for Special Olympics PEI, and they raised over net $37,000. So I just want to commend all the organizers, all the volunteers, and of course, all the participants. And I hope to see some of my colleagues tonight at the Special Olympics Awards. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And from New Haven, Rocky Point, I'd like to welcome my constituent, Lauren Yo. And uh, I think everybody in here would have a story about Lauren. Uh, the Premier did. and But I think mine will save them next, for next time I visit you on Jameson Lane, <coughs> Lauren. But a uh, wonderful constituent has, has a storied history here on Prince Edward Island and uh, a dear friend. So welcome to you, Lauren. And before I sit down, I also want to uh, make note that Alicia McCachran is sitting in the chair today. Again, I think her first time sitting here in the House. So welcome, Alicia and thank you for all the work you do for us here. Okay. Um, the Honourable... Two statements by members, starting with the Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Investing in our communities begins with the most essential of services. Surrey Hospital's emergency department has been closed since 2006. Kings County Memorial Hospital in Montague, which is the closest emergency department, has had their hours cut back. Madam Speaker, neither Surrey nor Montague currently have a walk-in clinic. The Surrey Hospital emergency room was closed on January 1st, 2006, with advisement that people in the area might have to settle on a series of walk-in clinics. The Eastern Kings Health Centre clinic was shut down in 2011. The clinic had been open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Thursday through Sunday. Madam Speaker, without regular ER hours or walk-in clinics in Kings County, the result is increased pressure 
on our ground ambulance service and the QEH ER. In a perfect world, we would have an ER service in Kings County supplemented by walk-in clinics and patient medical homes. This is a vision that we are working on as a province, but as you know, we are not there yet. We know that staffing is a challenge to maintain the service, but they are a challenge that we must meet as a province. So Madam Speaker, I'll close in saying that I know that this is a priority for our government, but I also want to emphasize that this house, to this house, that it is also a priority for Islanders that I represent from District 1, Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to let everyone across this great island know of the wonderful things happening in the greatest district, District 21, Summerside, Wilmot. The Holland College Hurricanes, the 2023 ACAA champions, are hosting the 2023 Canadian Collegiate Athletic Association National <coughs> Women's Soccer Championship at the Eric Johnson Field in Summerside from November the 8th to the 11th. The event will feature the top eight collegiate women's soccer teams from across Canada as they compete to become the 2023 national champions. Although this will be the 10th time the Hurricanes have hosted the CCAA National Championships, this is the first time it will be hosted in Summerside. This is an excellent opportunity for local tourism and our business sector who will benefit from over a million dollars in projected economic revenue from these events. Holland College Hurricanes have a berth in a national semifinal game for the first time ever. The Hurricanes bring an undefeated record in 2023 into a match against the Dynamics de saint Foy from Quebec on November 9th at Eric Johnson Field at 5.30. Now don't let my speaking of that event overshadow the unbelievable talent that is on display at the Credit Union Place where the SETS team is co-hosting the World Under-17 Hockey Championships. Now, Madam Speaker, as the week comes to an end, the Credit Union Place is also opening its doors for the, to the Island Petroleum Energy Centre to house a Remembrance Day service. Now, with the chance of unpleasant weather, all Islanders are invited to join the thousands of others who will fill the rink. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The opening of our fall session coincides with Veterans Week. And while November the 11th is yet to come this year, many services of remembrance are held on the Sunday that precedes November the 11th. And last Sunday, I had the honour of attending two such services. As a trumpet player, I'm sometimes asked to play the last post at these events, and it's a moment that's very heavy with emotion. I'm very deeply aware of the responsibility that surrounds perhaps the most poignant moment in the act of remembrance. And I think that's because music has the unique ability to reach down into our souls and to stir those feelings that make us most human. The last post is technically not a hard piece to play, but that's certainly not the case emotionally. It gets me each and every time I play it. The morning event last Sunday was at St. Mark's Presbyterian Church, where the Reverend Tom Hamilton always performs a dramatic and very moving reenactment of a Canadian soldier's wartime experience, often with close ties to Prince Edward Island. The afternoon commemoration was in Crapo Community Hall, where each year they hold an ecumenical services involving all of the South Shore churches. At that service, the Reverend Karen McLeod spoke very eloquently ab about um, quoting a book written by Nancy Steves that she had sourced when she shaped her remarks. And Karen's comments were centered around building peace. And with two active regional wars happening as we speak, with all the associated horrors of those wars in full view to us all, it seemed like a very appropriate topic to pick. Remembrance is multifaceted memorializing, first of all, those individuals who have died in conflict, making the ultimate sacrifice so that we may live in freedom, lest we forget. But remembrance is also about the fact that wars are a horror to be avoided, if at all possible. As Reverend MacLeod said, the end of conflict might give us a treaty. The end of war might give us an armistice. The end of a battle might give us a ceasefire. War gives us these things, but it cannot give us peace. Peace is not won. Peace is made through the hard work of refusing to be enemies. 
It's about refusing to give in to the hate, to greed, to the most depraved human emotions that fuel division, death, and destruction. Peacemaking is a habit that begins in each of our hearts. The world has shown us that while we have achieved the ability to bomb the world to pieces, we have yet to learn that we can never bomb the world to peace. As we commemorate this time of remembering, let us remember the costs of war and the tragedy of conflict. Let us never forget this, and let us choose to make peace begin in our hearts, in our homes, in our workplaces, and in our communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions by members, uh, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. A question for the Premier. Community support is the key to helping vulnerable people, and our island has a long and a deeply valued tradition of assisting the vulnerable. I believe it's fair to say that the desire to help one another is among the province's greatest strengths. In its mishandling of the outreach centre, this government is destroying that tradition. Instead of community supports, divisions are being created across the city of Charlottetown and now across our great island. Madam Speaker, this is the true historic tragedy of this do-nothing government. Premier, you are messing with traditions, culture, values, and the desire to help. My question, how many residents has the Premier personally met with in the Park Street community since the relocation announcement? The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, it actually warms my heart to hear the Honourable Leader of the Opposition talking about working with groups and organizations and islanders and cooperating on this very important issue uh, that we need to deal with and we need to continue to do a better job of dealing with. Uh, we have many, many, many partners uh, who are doing wonderful work, uh, who are uh, providing a very necessary service to some of our most vulnerable islanders. Uh, we need that to continue. We need to work with many more partners to do that. I do believe it's one of the greatest uh, attributes we have as islanders to work together, uh, to care for one another, and particularly to look after those who need it most, our most vulnerable islanders. So I'm really, really glad to hear that the leader of the opposition has changed his tone and now he wants to work uh, across the board. I appreciate that. So thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And the Premier can spin it whatever way he wants. The truth and the facts are out there. So as I said before, our province's incredible historic commitment to helping one another is among our greatest values and traditions. And as I said, this government's mismanagement of the Outreach Centre is a direct assault on those in in institutions and instincts that genuine, that genuine desire among islanders to support one another, Madam Speaker. So earlier this week, the member from Surrey, Elmira, publicly responded to local rumours about vulnerable people staying in his community. He said, and I quote, I understand everyone's apprehension, but please stay calm. End quote. Please stay calm. Surrey, one of the most caring, supportive communities in our province, and the local MLA is saying, stay calm. My question, does the Premier understand the damage that he is doing to our long-standing traditions of support and assistance and assistance to vulnerable islanders. The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I think I've been consistent from the beginning is that we need all hands on deck to work with everybody uh, that we can to provide these necessary services uh, that aren't going away, that are only growing, are going to need to be, continue to be offered uh, in our cities and towns across PEI for years to come. Uh, I would uh, suggest to the Honourable Member, as I have in person and in here, that the solution to working and to help those vulnerable islanders is not to stop the service or have only government provide the service. I think that would be a failing of epic proportions that wouldn't serve anybody. I think we have hundreds and thousands of partners who want to help. Uh, who have been helping, who want to continue to help, uh, and that's the road we're going to go down to deliver these very uh, complex uh, solutions to these very complex uh, issues, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And our province is known as a caring place. Look at our support for charitable organizations. We have a long and distinguished record of supporting those who help others. In many, many years, we have led this country in charity work. 
Look at our constant willingness to contribute to uh, food banks right across this island. Every time a call, a call is made, islanders respond. And Mr. Premier, what have you done because of your do-nothing mismanagement is to attack that cultural reality. You have pushed people into warming camps and suspicion, division, anger and fear. That's what the results are. Last week you said you would not want an outreach centre in your community. And you said, and I quote, I would surely feel the same way if this was beside my home, end quote. Apparently, that's what passes for leadership in the Premier's mind, Madam Speaker. So how on earth does this Premier expect anyone to feel any differently, and most especially in the face of his do-nothing mismanagement? The Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I can be accused of being naive and optimistic, and I think if you have to have human qualities uh, that people can poke holes in. I would prefer to have those two than to have the opposite. I think we have to remember as islanders who we are, uh, the compassion that we need to have for those who are in need of services, uh, those vulnerable islanders who are facing challenges around addictions and mental health and homelessness, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, nobody sets out in life to do that. Uh, we have a responsibility to work, to provide services, to help those along the way, uh, to make their lives the best we can make it. And we also have to understand that we need to provide these services and to integrate them into growing communities, large and small, across this province, Madam Speaker. That's what we have been doing. That's what we've been trying to do. We're working with dozens of organizations who are helping provide this very, very valuable service. Uh, and the path forward for us is to continue to offer these services. Uh, we know we need to relocate from Houston Street because of the challenges that we've talked here for a long time, Madam Speaker. That's what we're trying to do as we work toward providing these uh, uh, programs and defining a long-term solution to help these islanders, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, if the City of Charlottetown denies the province's application to relocate the outreach centre to Park Street, Premier, what is your plan? That's a very, very simple question. What in the God's name is your plan. The Honourable Premier. Well, I would say, Madam Speaker, the more important question would be what could we do in here to make sure that we can allow this move to happen to provide these services while we work toward a long-term solution? Rather than trying to use this as an issue, as some kind of political wedge issue, so to speak, uh, Madam Speaker, to drive wedges between communities, I think this, this is a horrible thing to be trying to do in here. We need to have compassion. Uh, for these islanders. We need to understand that there are people who are living near where these services are being offered that are having their lives impacted and we need to work with them to make sure we limit that to the best degree that we can. But we can't stop these services, Madam Speaker. I, as I said in here before, I hope and I trust that the members of Charlottetown City Council will provide a positive temporary relocation to Park Street for these services as we work toward a long-term solution, Madam Speaker. And I would hope I could count on others in this legislature to do the same, Madam Speaker, but so far we haven't had that from the Liberal opposition. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. I'll be asking my questions on behalf of those islanders, the unhoused islanders we're talking about. Some of them might even be in the gallery here today. The other night I saw one of those islanders who was at the Charlottetown Library in the soaking rain. It was almost a rainy, snowy night. And he called me and he had to get all the way to Park Street, 2.7 kilometers away. And his friend who was here was with him and another friend took him over there. That was a desperate call. That was a long trip. And I met him at Park Street and I want to know for him a few different questions here today. Why have we not made our shelters 24-7 permanently across this, this area. This government has taken that away. You took it away at Bedford McDonald House. It's not there at Park Street. Our communities need them. Minister of Housing, why are our shelters not 24-7? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, uh, um, we have a motion coming forward to discuss this in a more complete way um, at some point. Um, I would say that some of our shelters are in fact 24 hours in Prince Edward Island. Um, just a few short years ago, uh, there were maybe 30 sh emergency shelter beds in Prince Edward Island. There's more than 100 now. And some of those do operate 24 hours a day. Uh, with regard to Park Street, 
It is a 12-hour service at this point, but it works in complement with the outreach centre, which is also available during the daytime. Um, I would say that if we were able to make the move temporarily down to Park Street with the outreach services, it will operate as a de facto 24-hour shelter. But uh, we'll work towards a, uh, a, a more optimal model as we move along, and that'll include consideration of 24-hour services for our vulnerable populations. Honourable member from Charlottetown West Royalty. The Outreach Centre has always been inaccessible for people with disabilities. You cannot access that facility. $3 million in last year's capital budget seems like it was an investment. I don't know what that was for. The person in question I'm talking to cannot access the services there, goes to the Charlottetown Library. The shelter telephone line does not work from the Charlottetown Library. This is a disjointed approach, whether it is, whether it is the person that I'm speaking at was at an accessibility facility, was at the New Roots facility in Smith Lodge, but we changed it and he can't go there anymore. Minister, this doesn't jive. Nothing in this program jives and it's spreading across the province. Our social license as a province is in question here. Minister, what are you doing to make sure that people with accessibility issues have the right needs and necessary treatment in our facilities that they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I, I would say that we could probably do better, um, certainly with respect to the outreach centre in terms of accessibility. I'm familiar um, with um, the particular case uh, that the members alluding to and some of the challenges that particular client has had. And um, we do have two fully accessible units at the Park Street Shelter. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, how often those are unavailable for people who, who need them, uh, but they are there and uh, it's something we'll have to do, uh, we'll, we'll have to do better uh, to make sure that our accessibility uh, is, is there for the people that need it. And um, with respect to the Outreach Centre, it is an old building. It predates the building code. It was never made accessible, and uh, uh, we could do better in, in adapting it. Uh, but certainly when we, if and when we are able to relocate, uh, we'll be certain to uh, have accessibility as top of mind. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, I just want to shift gears to maybe a few things that was said yesterday about the City of Summerside. The City of Summerside has a long, successful history of supporting its residents. They are very <coughs> proud of the work they've done to assist the vulnerable population. The type of partner that this, this do-nothing government should be seeking out and working with. Um, instead, the government and it alienates, alienates them and the minister's failed approach is thrust upon them and the comments yesterday are, are, are backtracking, I would consider backtracking in nature. Question to the minister. What would you say to the city residents of Summerside who are wary of your inaction, recent comment and mismanagement of shelters across our province? And are, what, what would your plan be imposed on the, this failing model in the communities without understanding the needs of the vulnerable communities such as Summerside? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I would say that um, he, the member may have mischaracterized that relationship somewhat. Um, I have a, a, a wonderful relationship with the mayor. We speak regularly. I spoke with him this morning. Um, coming up next week, uh, we have a, a workshop in Summerside, uh, sponsored by my department and the John Howard Society in Summerside. And we're bringing together all of the available resources in Summerside who serve the vulnerable community there. And this is part of our attempt to uh, create a model there uh, that's more ideal for delivering these services, that puts people on a pathway to the services they need, rather than the outreach model that we've used here where we're trying to, to centralize those services. Now, we, we, we're continuing our, our, our efforts to stand up the, uh, the shelter services and supportive housing services we need there. It's a difficult process, I can tell you. Um, my department made an offer on a quite a suitable property there last uh, last week, and unfortunately, the vendor declined to sell it to us based on what they assumed that we were going to use it for. So that was we were excited that uh, that it might be uh, a great opportunity, and um, uh, unfortunately, we're we're circling back to Plan B. Uh, we have an expression of interest that will be released very shortly. 
Uh, it's uh, ready to go, just being reviewed by our procurement services, and uh, that will be on the street soon to, um, to help uh, identify a partner there to help deliver these services. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, I too was in contact with members of council and um, you know our leaders in the area. Sorry, um, you know, and it, it's just it's just frustrating because it, it, it's it's a growing frustration that those those comments are a growing frustration that we don't have much like Shatton, we don't have a plan B. Uh, you you just said it. We, we well. Minister, you, you were on record talking about a shelter support for this winter, and I, I, don't, I don't know. I've got comments, and I've got, I'm, I'll table these documents later. Um, what happens if, if plan B doesn't work out? You're supposed to have, I couldn't sleep last night because the wind was howling. I heard the wind. We've got to think about our, our, our community partners and members in Summerside who might be on the street. What are we going to do for this winter? Winter in, in Summerside, are you going to have a shelter as you promised? The yeah, Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, this time last year I was engaged in other pursuits and my uh, attention was elsewhere, but I seem to recall that uh, similar questions were being directed at the former minister who was responsible for standing up uh, emergency services here. Uh, that sense of urgency and uh, uh, we're, we're in the same position, but uh, I'm confident we'll deliver. and. Uh, uh, this is just the beginning of a process for delivering um, a suite of services to vulnerable uh, residents in Summerside and throughout Prince Edward Island. Well, I'm a member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here, but this was in June 1st. I asked you the questions. I asked the Premier the questions. There were supposed to be take-backs, and I'll, I'll table this right here. I went through it today. No, nothing back, nothing back, nothing back. We didn't even get the data from that. It's not here. Um, you are backtracking, and this is too important to do this. Either you, either you, you, fi you fix this or you give the license to Summerside to do it. You're asking for $1.3 million back um, with mistakes that you made. Give that money back to Summerside if you can't get a shelter in there. Allow them to do it and make sure this gets done. If you can't do it, they will because they're a good community and they want to get this done and they care about the unhoused communities. Minister, what are we doing here? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I, I don't know how it slipped my mind, but um, I should report to the House today that um, we will be, we, we've, we've done some work over the last couple of weeks, we've just been waiting for some uh, approvals and um, working with our partners there, but I can tell you that the, uh, the men's shelter on uh, Winter Street in Summerside will be expanding uh, by another four beds. It's currently six beds, so we'll be increasing the capacity significantly there immediately uh, while we work on plans for uh, more emergency overnight shelter in Summerside. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Speaker May 19th, and again on June 20th, I stood in this house and asked the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism and Sport about the creation of an oyster lease moving policy for those impacted by Hurricane Fiona or other future extreme weather. I told the Minister that numerous oyster growers have shown me that Hurricane Fiona created new channels in the Conway Sandhills that have created extra turbulence and impacted their oyster cages. I told the Minister of a need to have a policy for these leases to happen need to occur. The minister told this house he was doing everything possible to speed up the process, promised to speak to his staff, and understood the gravity. He even committed to getting things done before fall freeze up. Question the minister of fisheries. <laughs> it's fall, minister, and we heard the wind howling. I can see it was pretty rough last night out in the Gulf of St. Lawrence coming to the Conway Sandhills, but why do I have to keep asking these questions? Can you update this house on how many lease yeah, requests no question, to be moved yeah, yeah. and how many have been approved to be moved as of today? Minister of Fisheries, uh, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I, I do appreciate it. I know the member actually. Um, so what we did is we, we had to amend the, the, uh, the PEI Shellfish Aquaculture Leasing Program to add in a policy to move um, these leases in an emergency situation. Um, however, it's only to move leases that are um, deemed to be impacted right now. So it doesn't look at future impact. It doesn't look at future impacts because we can't open the door if we just say, "Well, if you want to move one lease, then it, 
everyone will start wanting to move, uh, to move their leases. So what we, and I think actually the member might have um, had, had the idea as well to, to get a study done on that area. So um, we actually um, hired expert consultants, uh, Harborside Engineering, I believe, um, to study the area and they did a study. And uh, there was um, that six that had applied to move. Um, I believe two were approved to move already. Um, and I believe the others should have, uh, the letters might be in the mail actually now. So, yeah. So we're talking a half a dozen applications, oh. Mr. Speaker, oh. Madam Speaker. A half a dozen. And, you know, the clock is definitely ticking here. Uh, and we're only talking, you know, the leases, there's 820 sites in Prince of Rhode Island, Ms., uh, Madam Speaker, of 7,300 leased acres. So it's not, we're not talking a huge amount here. And uh, so I certainly understand that the federal government plays a role in this. And I'd like to know if the minister has uh, had any conversations with the Minister of Fishery, it's an ocean's Diane Boutelier, and have you actually developed a policy? What is the actual policy? Maybe you can inform the House if you're saying there's letters that have gone out. What's the policy? Yeah, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I haven't had any direct conversations with the federal minister exactly on this. Um, but I have been to the area and I met with uh, one fisherman and went out on his, uh, on his boat with him to look at the lease. And because there was an issue, he, he didn't think that um, they had perhaps looked at his lease uh, properly, that um, there was issues with the current coming in and flipping his cages. So they took a look at that and I think they're reviewing that one again. So um, I think there should be a decision on that one late, um, probably later in November, I believe, is the date for uh, public consultation to close on that. Um, but I'm more than happy to share the uh, report with the member that the study that we did, um, the experts did. I think it was actually a very thorough report. And uh, I know our staff were extremely pleased with it because sometimes you can do these things and you get something back and you're like, ah, oh, geez. But they were quite happy with this and, and the work that they did. Um, it's all mapped out. Um, it's, 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 where, it's very well done. And I think if uh, when you can see it, um, you'll appreciate the work that was done and, and the, thought, the thought that's gone into the policy. Member from O'Leary and Dress. Well, I can, I can appreciate that, Minister, that, that uh, you know, we're still talking with six leases. You got one approved, and you got one uh, maybe that might get an approval shortly. We got four others, but for whatever reasons, those four others believe that they were not treated fairly, that they did not take all, all things into account. And uh, one of the things that they're asking for, they want to meet with you, Minister. Will you make the commitment today to sit down and meet with all six of those uh, applications, but if you get two, let's, let's deal with the four that uh, haven't, and explain to them the policy and uh, the report and uh, see if there's any discrepancies that can be dealt with. Will you meet with those people, Minister? Hello, yeah. Minister Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I will, and I'll take the Honourable Member with yeah. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Islanders are struggling with the rising cost of rents and the new Residential Tenancy Act, like the um, Rental of Residential Property Act, sets out the process. Oh my goodness, sets out the process for granting rent increases above the annual allowable guidelines. One of the factors that must be considered in the landlord's expectation of a re let me start. The, oh, holy cow, I'm having troubles today. One of the factors that must be considered is the landlord's expectation of a reasonable return on their capital investment. A question for the Minister of Housing. When it comes to rental housing, what do you think is it a reasonable return on capital investment? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I know that that particular question was uh, a difficult um, piece of the process in developing the, uh, the, the act. And uh, uh, it's a complicated question. Um, financing of uh, an investment in uh, housing properties is, uh, is sometimes a risky uh, investment. Sometimes it's rewarding, but uh, uh, it, uh, it's dependent on market conditions, it's dependent on regulations, but we need it to be a proposition that makes sense for, for people to invest in. So what's reasonable in, uh, in one decade may be unreasonable in the next. It depends on market conditions very much. It's, uh, uh, it depends on how properties are appreciating because some of that uh, return on investment may be entirely 
through appreciation. So it's a complicated uh, question to answer, and I know that it was one that was uh, wrestled with uh, throughout the uh, development of, of the new RTA. Honorable Leader, the third party, your su first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In past decisions, the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission stated that 4 to 7 percent is a reasonable return on capital investment. However, it appears that at the director level, rent increases above the guideline are being granted despite all re landlords already earning upwards of a 15 percent return on capital investment at the time of application, nearly four times what the Commission thinks is reasonable. Minister, why are tenants being ordered to pay greater rents to increase already unreasonable returns on investment? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, we, we delegate the, uh, uh, the rent increases through the regulations and, and uh, associated with the Act to the Director of uh, um, Residential Rental. Um, and uh, it would be surprising to me. I'd like to, to understand more about the specific cases that you're referring to. And uh, it's a complicated issue, and there's a fine balance between uh, t protecting tenants and affordability and uh, maintaining a healthy housing market where private invest investment can help uh, build the inventory of our, our uh, un housing units in the province. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, your second supplementary. Madam Speaker, you're in luck. I'm going to table these decisions and, and uh, the details around them. One way to fix this problem is to legislate a fixed percentage as a reasonable return on investment. This would have the effect of preventing rent increases above the annual guideline where landlords are already earning in excess of what could be considered a reasonable return on investment. Does the Minister support legislating IRAC's finding of 4 to 7 percent as a reasonable return on investment to protect tenants from unfair rent increases in the future. The Honourable uh, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it is a new act and it's certainly, as with any legislation, it's a living document and it's our job here. We have that privilege to be here to respond to changing conditions, to uh, correcting issues as we see them with legislation and how they affect the real world. We often don't understand uh, uh, exactly how the market will respond or uh, how particular circumstances of the time will respond. So uh, we're certainly cognizant of many things. I've met with uh, folks at IRAC. Uh, we've discussed how the, uh, the act is, is being received and how well it's working and how well it is not working. So I'm certainly open to um, any changes going forward that uh, uh, allows us to have a very healthy housing market for both tenants, landlords, developers and uh, it's certainly a priority. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Back in the early 1990s, a group of islanders saw that the network of abandoned railway lines from tip to tip on PEI could be repurposed into a non-motorised hiking and biking trail, what we now know as the Confederation Trail. Their vision resulted in what is widely considered to be a provincial treasure, used and loved by residents and visitors alike. In a busy and hectic world, the Confederation Trail offers something that so many from away seek and that we islanders are blessed to experience every day, peace, unspoiled nature, pastoral beauty. A question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Do you agree that these attributes are key parts of providing recreational and health benefits to islanders and in attracting the growing number of tourists who are seeking tranquility and an escape from the bustle and the noise of their everyday lives? Madam Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I do thank uh, the Honourable Member for the questions and uh, uh, the very way that he phrased that question to the peace, the tranquility, certainly things that we as islanders right from tip to tip treasure greatly, uh, Madam Speaker. You look at the trail systems that have been developed right across the province in addition, Madam Speaker, to the Confederation Trail, but certainly ones in the western part of the province that I give tremendous credit to volunteer organizations, individuals, groups, such as the Forest View Trail, and how that is in such, as uh, the Honourable Member has indicated, such a picturesque and tranquil location. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
the Honourable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, your first supplementary. Interesting Very answer. I, <laughs> yeah. Lovely, lovely answer. <laughs> <laughs> The Island Walk, uh, or the Camino de la Isla, has become, in an incredibly short time, a magnet for long-distance hikers looking for exactly the sort of peaceful experience that we just agreed are so important here on Prince Edward Island, something we can offer. Innumerable cyclists also flock here, and like the walkers, they stay for extended times. They lodge at inns and bed and breakfasts across the province, and, and they eat in rural, particularly in rural restaurants. Um, in all, three, in all three counties, to the same minister. Has, the de has your department done an economic analysis of this increasing number of non-motorized users who come here in increasing numbers because of the current condition and the peace and the tranquility of the Confederation trip? The General Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, again, thank the honorable member for the uh, question. Uh, we look, yes, tourism, so many different aspects of tourism, Madam Speaker, contribute to the economic well-being of this province. And without a doubt, uh, cyclists, hikers that make use of the various facilities, the various amenities, uh, our restaurants, our accommodations, that is one and a very important part, uh, Madam Speaker, of the economic activity that is generated by those who come to the island, but also, Madam Speaker, by those that reside, that live on this beautiful island of ours, 24 hours a day, 12 months a year, 365 days. So I think that we always have to be cognizant of the importance of the tranquility and of the ability, Madam Speaker, uh, to make use of these trails, whether it's a Confederation trail, Madam Speaker, or whether it's individual trails, such as Forest View that I just mentioned. Thank you. <coughs> the Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I mean, it's so nice to hear the, the Minister speak of the, the importance of our peace and tranquility, and for apparently members on the governing side to agree with the minister's position. So it's lovely to see that in smiling faces. Recently, the province has solicited public feedback on the Confederation Trail usage in both an online survey and public, many public consultation meetings have been held to the same minister. Given the economic benefits associated with non-motorized use of the Confederation Trail, what steps are you taking to encourage and protect the continued use of the trail by pedestrians and cyclists? General Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do thank uh, the member for, uh, for raising the fact that we are having a consultation right across this province. Uh, so far, we have had four public events that were extremely well attended, Madam Speaker. There's been over 2,500 submissions made online, Madam Speaker. And I think it's extremely important, certainly for me as minister, to hear the opinions, the feedback, the comments, the suggestions, Madam Speaker, that everyday islanders are prepared in the engagement that they have on this particular issue. Uh, it's certainly, it's very uh, rewarding, I would have to say, Madam Speaker, for me to see the interest that has been shown in this public consultation. Thank you. Speaker, and carrying on with this line of question, um, the Minister of Transportation has commissioned four Confederation Trail workshops and an online survey, as we've heard, to quote, help shape policy decisions concerning the use of the Confederation Trail. And at the meetings, ATV riders are asking for full access to the trail, as opposed to the ability to just cross it, especially in areas that are perceived as low usage, where it is difficult to build and uh, dedicated ATV trails. In fact, many of my constituents are concerned that the workshops were set up at the request of the ATV lobby with this end in mind. It would be, Madam Speaker, it would be very helpful to know what the current usage is in terms of number of pedestrians, runners, cyclists, horses, etc., for different segments of the trail. So a question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Can you table statistics regarding the current use of the Confederation Trail? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, the first thing, Madam Speaker, that I would like to address is the comment that the honorable member made that these workshops were as a result of a request from the ATV Federation. Uh, Madam Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, shortly after coming into the position as Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, I had the opportunity, I reached out to the Snowmobile Association, to the Trail Riders Association, Madam Speaker, and yes, to the ATV Federation. Also, I've had numerous conversations with islanders right across the province, Mr. Speaker, with regard to the usage and the importance of the Confederation Trail. And Madam Speaker, that is what brought about, that is what precipitated me initiating this co public consultation. And Madam Speaker, again, as, uh, as I said previously, I don't think it's ever a bad thing to solicit and receive input, feedback from everyday islanders on any issue. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to press time real different Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, uh, and that's good to know, Madam Speaker. And uh, just to be clear, what I'm hearing from my constituents, many of them, is that they believe that ATVs should not share the Confederation Trail with pedestrians and cyclists. They believe it's too dangerous. However, most are not against ATVs on PEI. With a dedicated ATV trail from tip to tip and the safe ability for ATVs to access restaurants, accommodations and fueling stations, there is a huge opportunity to, gr to grow ATV use on PEI, especially when it comes to year-round tourism by ATV riders. So another question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. What funding initiatives and supporting legislation regulations are you considering to support a dedicated ATV trail from tip to tip with safe access to restaurants, <coughs> accommodations, and fueling stations? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, you know, I do appreciate uh, the Honourable Member referencing safety. That always has to be paramount in any decisions that are made, and whether it's with regard to trails, whether it's with regard to our highway system, any of the various aspects, Madam Speaker, that fall under my Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, with regard to uh, the ATV Federation, I have to give them uh, full kudos for the initiatives that they have taken in working with my department on certain pilot uh, trails right across the province, but in certain areas, uh, certainly in the western part, but in different areas of the province. And I do agree with uh, the Honourable Member that there is tremendous opportunities here to work with the ATV Federation and to grow the tourism aspect of ATV. Thank you. The Honourable Member for us, Governor, to leave second Thank supplementary. You, Speaker, and I hope the Minister does work with the ATV Federation, and I hope we do make some improvements and we, we seize this opportunity to make the island accessible to ATV riders and, con and keep the Confederation Trail for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so, Madam Speaker, many also believe, like across the board, many people believe that the Confederation Trail is an underused resource. Um, and that's why I asked for the stats at the beginning, and I hope you can get some of them. Uh, with more marketing improvements such as the addition of water stations and safe paths from the trail uh, to restaurants and accommodations, the usage could be increased, especially by tourists. So a question to the Minister of Tourism, Sports and Culture. What are your plans to support and promote cycling and pedestrian use of the Confederation Trail? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So once um, I had seen these consultations taking place across the island, I'd asked what the usage is and on the, of the trail. And um, what the actually department told me is that about 16% of non-resident visitors use the Confederation Trail while they're here, some for like, cycling or uh, walking or hiking or whatnot. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that I think what's important here is that I think the narrative that's gotten out there, and, and this decision falls within the Ministry of Transportation, but is that ATVs are going to be able to, you know, you're going to jump on an ATV and take Nish and be able to take the trail right to Surrey, which I don't believe is going to happen. I don't think it should happen. Um, but our department, through the Rural Growth Initiative, assists the ATV Federation in building their own trails, which we're more than happy to do, and we continue to do that. Um, from what I understand, just from my time when I was in that department and, and in tourism now, we obviously want to protect that trail um, for pedestrians and cyclists. 
is that perhaps there's areas across the island, when, and I'm talking like maybe a few, like a few spots where ATVs might be looking to use a short section in a low volume traffic area um, to connect their trails at their existing trails. Um, so they want to be able to connect those trails. That's what I gather they're trying to find. I think the narrative's kind of gotten away in the, in the media out there and people are out rightfully getting, you know, concerned and, and sharing their feedback. So, um, you know, I think we don't have to all panic and think that there's going to be ATVs and the Confederation Trail everywhere. And, um, but our department's more than willing and happy to work with uh, the Federation to develop their own trails. And um, it's also huge for winter tourism as well and tourism in general in the fall and other areas because they bring in people from outside the province and they spend money here. So the ATVs uh, generate tourism as well. The Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Government has done a lot over the last few years to improve access to heat pumps for islanders to re reduce their costs and their energy footprint. One of the commitments we made during the election was to move towards supplying heat pumps to island households making less than $100,000 a year. Question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, how is this work coming along? The yeah, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we'll be switching the program here sometime before Christmas. We're working on the the uh, category that we're working on now is the below $75,000. So we're, we want to make sure that we got those ones cleaned up before we move to the, ne the next uh, uh, stage of it. But we do have close to 7,000 heat pumps installed, which equ equates to about 7 million litres of oil displaced per year from, uh, from our carbon emissions. So uh, we're pretty happy with our program to date, but we uh, plan to ramp it up here. Stay tuned. The Honourable Member from Summerside will your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, one thing that I heard when I was going door to door in some of our senior housing is the question was asked around the heating and cooling in our sen senior housing units. Most of these places use oil and would likely benefit from access to heat pumps, if not in their individual units in common areas where the residents congregate. Questions to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What needs to happen in order for us to begin or to think about transitioning parts of our publicly owned senior housing units over to heat pumps from oil for heat and cooling? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. I think we just need to do it. I think that we, it's been working its way through the system. It's a, a policy that's been developed between uh, my department and, and housing. We're getting ready to, uh, to take it for approval up through the cabinet cycle here, so I think you'll probably hear some more about it really, really soon, but yeah, we just have to do it. The Honourable Member from Summerside will your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, one last question for the Minister. Uh, the other thing that I got asked a lot was around multi-unit multi properties, like apartment buildings. So a question for the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, is there any discussion on or where do things stand on setting up a pro program to deal with converting multi-unit properties to run on heat pumps instead of oil? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So we have a program now. Our uptake has been really low, unfortunately. So um, I'd like to say when it comes to our, our climate action and our, our mitigation of carbon, we're, we're at the carrot stage. But the stick stage is coming, so it'd be great if those people that are own multi-unit apartment buildings took us up on it now, because they're going to have to. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, last final question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So on November the 3rd, the Premier told Islanders that he met with all kinds of experts over the summer, trying to find a solution to a problem created by his do-nothing government. On Tuesday, I asked the Premier to table his calendar with these meetings. But still, he has not. So, Madam Speaker, I will ask again. Will the Premier please find the relevant sections from his calendar for June, July, and August of 2023 that indicate when these meetings took place, how long they were, and table those in the House tomorrow? The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, as I've already committed to, uh, we will go through the process to see what can line up with what the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition is looking for and provide that rel relevant information uh, as timely as we can. Madam Speaker, we'll say my uh, calendar's online as far as I know and uh, uh, pretty easy to access. Thank you, Madam Speaker. End of question period. Statements by Ministers. <clears throat>
presenting and receiving petitions. Order. The member from Summerside Wilmot. Madam Speaker, the clerk having reported that the petition praying an act to amend an act to incorporate Amalgamate Dairies Limited is in acceptable form. I move, seconded by the member from District 1, Surrey Almira, that the said bill now be read a first time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 200, an act to amend and act to incorporate amalgamate, Amalgamated Dairies Limited. Read a first time. Do you have an overview, Minister, or member? No? Uh, that the amendments to the act will be to change the size of the board of directors in section one from 15 members to 11 to 15 members. Section two, it is going to change the age of the person. Uh, Amalgamate Dairies Limited from all persons over 16 years of age who are producers, patrons, shareholders to all natural persons 18 years of age or older corporations, partnerships or trusts or estates who are producers, patrons, and shareholders. And section three is amending 2021, 26, 31, and 32 of the act to reflect the extension of the membership to corporations, partnerships, trusts, and estates. Thank you, member. <coughs> Honorable member from Summerside, Wilmot. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the member from District 1, Surrey Elmira, that the said bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills, and Privileges for its consideration and report. Tell it carry. <clears throat> Tabling of documents. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. The House, I beg leave to table um, IRAC decisions on greater than allowable rent increases that I referenced in my questions, and I move seconded by the member from New Haven, Rocky Point, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, questions regarding issues facing unhoused islanders in Summerside from June 1st uh, from Hansard in 2023, specifically islanders getting evicted and supports that were lacking. To a carry. Now, a member from Charlottetown West Royalty. CBC article dated August 31st. It's entitled Minister Promises New Shelters for Summerside as Residents Call for More Housing. Uh, more specifically, page seven and nine, and I move uh, move seconded by uh, O'Leary and Burness. Said document be now received and do lie on the table. So carry. Here. The honourable member for Charlton West Royalty. By leave of the house, I beg leave to table a CBC article on Summerside shelters delayed by the quest uh, to avoid issues that haunt Charlottetown, and I move seconded by O'Leary and Burness. The said document be now received and do lie on the table. So carry. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a Facebook post from October the 27th, 2023, by Island Trails, which closes, let not the interests of some, albeit well-intentioned, move us in the direction that could detract from our gentle island essence, the quiet solitude of nature that so many seek and may not be so easily restored once lost. And I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave, uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, an article in National Geographic um, titled Three Adventurous Ways to Explore Canada's Prince Edward Island, and it opens home to idyllic coastal views and a winding network of epic forest trails. Prince Edward Island inspires an intrepid approach. And I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table another article, this time from Forbes magazine, which is titled, Cycling Through a Bucolic Paradise on Prince Edward Island. And I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table another 
um, media article, this time from BBC in the United Kingdom, called Canada's New 700-Kilometer Island Pathway. And I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, moving on to another topic, Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter of support to expand the con consultation on the medical, um, Mental Health Act by BIPOC Usher, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? And finally, Madam Speaker. Yes. Thank you. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a paper entitled Community Treatment Orders Evolution and Comparison, written by Drs. Uh, John Gray and Richard O'Reilly. And I move, seconded by the Leader of the Third Party, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry? Carried. Thank you. Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Government motions, orders of the day government. The Honourable, Member, uh, Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population that the order number 17 be now read. Shall it carry? Order 17, Mental Health Act, Bill number 28, ordered for in committee. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Yeah. <coughs> Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole House. The House is now a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a, be a bill to be intituled the Mental Health Act. Is it uh, honour to the promoter? Would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? I would. Shall I carry? Very good. Hi, Nicola. Welcome back. Um, could you uh, just uh, reiterate your name and title for Hansers? Nicola Hewitt, Solicitor and Legislative Specialist with the Department of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, we are in, uh, we have decided to go uh, section by section temporarily here, and uh, we are currently uh, still debating section one, the definitions, and I have the uh, member for Rustico Emerald uh, in the midst of questions. Would you like to continue or put back on the list? Uh, can, can I just speak for a second? My uh, apologies. Nicola, you have the floor and before we ask, uh, uh, get back into questions. So I just wish to apologize to the House yesterday for my abrupt departure. It wasn't intentional. I'm really sorry. And I'm sorry I ran out on you. Um, What's your question, Brad? Yeah, no, it wasn't. I, I don't even know what your questions were. I was feeling that bad. So. Um, I am. I'm feeling much better. Thank you. And, 
If you can you indulge me just for a minute? Absolutely. I know I wasn't on top of my game yesterday, <laughs> and I did want to provide some clarity to the member from Charlottetown West Royalty on the mobile mental health workers and, and how we had envisioned incorporating them into the act. So it's my understanding that the mobile mental health team are primarily paramedics and nursing staff. They're not trained necessarily trained to apprehend individuals. Most people who are being apprehended are unwilling to be taken to a health facility um, for involuntary medical examination. And there may be um, instances where the mobile mental health staff are in potentially volatile situations. So the other thing to bear in mind, and I know I did refer to this yesterday, is the mobile mental, in, in addition to the potential for violence, they're not trained in um, necessarily in, in charter rights, what people's charter rights are and how they're protected. In fact, I had to go and double check some of the charter rights. Um, and so what I will point out is our sub, and I think I referred to it yesterday, our subsection 4.2 uh, provides the court with discretion to determine who may be the most appropriate individual to apprehend the person, a peace officer or other person. So the, the judge has the discretion to decide in the circumstances, you know, it could be a family member, it could be somebody else in the community, it could be a member of the mobile mental health team. So it would ba be based on a case-by-case -case type basis. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that, um, and I think, again, I'm kind of fuzzy on yesterday, but um, our notion of having a peace officer is consistent with New Brunswick says peace officer or other person the same as us. Ontario is police officer or a person. Alberta, Manitoba, Newfoundland is peace officer. Saskatchewan is peace officer or other person. BC is a police officer or a constable. And Nova Scotia is a member of a police force or an individual named in the order. So just, just to sort of give you a bit of background, right? Thank you, Thank Nicholas. you. Thank you, Prof. Rush to go, Elmer. Thank, Thank you, Chair, and it is good to see you back. Thank you. You're doing great. Um, so uh, I, I had asked uh, a little bit about the, the definitions and um, whether they were similar to the old act. You said yes, they were. And what uh, what I'm what I'm hoping is that the changes to this mental health act will mean we can help more people because, of course, the only reason where you would, uh, you know suspend their rights in order to do things like uh, in, in make them an involuntary patient is because they are harming themselves or others and they really need the help and it's the best thing for them, right? That's the, the theory behind it. So um, I was wondering, I guess, a two-part question. A, have, do you have stats showing how often the measures in the old act were used? And you can pick your time period in the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe whenever the act was implemented. And uh, do you have a plan uh, to track stats going forward, assuming this new act is, is proclaimed, so that we can compare um, the new act to the old act to see if it's achieving um, in what, in my opinion, the goal should be, which is to, to help more people, um, because I'm going, of course, from the assumption that there are, are people out there who are harming themselves and others um, that are, are not getting the help they need, and then that's one of the reasons you made the changes you did. So I don't have stats with us today. That's something we can certainly look into and bring back. Um, and on a go-forward basis, I would anticipate that there will be an evaluation done to, to see how, you know, post, post uh, the new act, how things have changed. Yeah. Rush to go, Elmer. So, I mean, during the briefing that I was part of for this act, I asked about the stats there uh -huh. as well, and you said you're going to look into them then. Yeah. So if, if there's a way that you yeah. can, anything that you have at all yeah. that you can bring back while the bill is on the floor, that would be, that would be great. Just to, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there will be an evaluation going forward. Um, I guess I'm looking for a commitment from the minister that you're actually going to do that evaluation. Um, I mean, it's tough. There's lots of priorities, and there's not as many resources to do everything, and I understand that, but I believe this is an area where even though we have an intention of doing that evaluation, I really want to make sure uh, that it happens. Yeah, again, it's, you know, it's a significant modernization of the Act, so I think, again, that's something that with the Department would almost do on an ongoing basis to understand, especially on the, from the clinical side, um, on the feedback from the clinicians too as well. So. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to, again, with such a, an old act, so to speak, is that be important the next year or two to, 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 look, to look at and see the, the impact. Thank you. That's it, Chair. Shall the section carry? Sure. Section two, purposes. Shall the section carry? Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, uh, so glad that you're feeling better, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a, do have a few questions on this section. The first one is that um, I'll sort of frame this by saying this section is our opportunity to to enshrine where you talked about this legislation as being a rights-based legislation yesterday, um, to, to really enshrine the rights in the purpose of the Act. And do you feel that the current wording of Section 2 here accomplishes that? Well, the rights, the rights are enshrined in the Charter, so we don't need to repeat them in the Act. Right? They are Charter, the, the rights that are set out in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. New Haven, Rocky Point. Sure, maybe I, 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 I didn't ask my question clearly enough, but this is when the Mental Health Act is invoked mm -hmm. in a, for an involuntary um, admission, for example, then those rights are, are superseded. So it's the, uh, it's the balance that we have. And you, again, you described it as a rights-based piece of legislation yesterday. So do you, uh, do you feel that the balance that we are all looking for and, and that Rustico Emerald spoke to a minute ago, do you think that the wording in our current act in this draft accomplishes that? Yes, I do. Okay. Yep. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, unsurprising. Um, and I, I appreciate the answer. Um, but if you look at other jurisdictions, I'm thinking particularly here about Newfoundland, um, they, and New Brunswick, they, they actually are very specific about using the least intrusive and least um, restrictive approaches when dealing with involuntary patients. And that's something that research also shows us is best practice. And I, um, I tabled a paper yesterday um, from the Canadian Psychiatric Association that speaks to that. And I'm wondering why we did not include that phrase, the least intrusive and, and least restrictive approach. I realize it appears later in the bill, but not here in the purpose. Yeah. Um, I feel that, I mean, w whenever we draft, we, we take a look across the country to see what other jurisdictions have done, and we may take pieces from here and pieces from there. So you've, you've identified two that have it, but there's probably a significant number that don't have it. Um, I, I feel it's more than adequate to say protect the, price, the rights of persons. Um, and um, yeah, as you noted, it's sprinkled throughout. Um, and I, I, I feel it, it's more than enough what's contained in the body of the Act, and you don't need to put everything in the proposive section of a bill. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. Uh, and I appreciate that absolutely not every act across the country mm -hmm. has that particular yep. phrase in there. But the more more recent um, jurisdictions who have amended or updated their mental health acts do have it. And although it's, it, it does appear later in the act, and I, I absolutely acknowledge that, when particularly in a situation where you have a piece of legislation that, that strips strips people's rights away. I, I think it's very helpful to have that in the purpose as it's a sort of sets a context for the act. And when folks are making decisions, uh, judges making decisions on um, particular incidences that may happen under the act, having that very explicitly stated in the purposes I think is a useful thing. So Chair, I, I have an amendment to bring forward to this section. I have a few amendments to the bill during the discussion today. Um, and this is a House Amendment to Section 2. Um, uh, do you want me to read that amendment? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, Move that subsection 2.1 of Bill 28 be deleted and the following substituted. Purposes. 1. The, pur the purposes of this Act are, sub A, to provide for the treatment, care and supervision of a person with a mental disorder that is likely to result in dangerous behaviour or in substantial mental or physical deterioration or serious physical impairment. B. To protect a person with a mental disorder from causing harm to him, herself or himself or another and to prevent a person with a mental disorder from suffering substantial mental or physical deterioration or serious physical impairment. 
C, to provide for the apprehension, detention, custody, restraint, observation, assessment, treatment and care and supervision of a person with a mental disorder by means that are the least restrictive and intrusive for the achievement of the purposes set out in clauses A and B, and D, to provide for the rights of persons apprehended, detained, restrained, admitted, assessed, treated and cared for and supervised under this Act. Chair, that's, uh, it encompasses everything that's already there, but just expands the definition a little bit. Do you have copies, Member? I do not. Okay. And My apologies. You, you have a, is your, you said you had multiple amendments. Is, is that all? Yes, on? not to this section. Okay. This so is the only one to section two. All right, members, we'll take a recess until we can make copies to distribute to the assembly. Um, I shall have copies of the other amendments made. Thank you, member. We'll just take a short recess.
All right, honorable members, uh, there should be a copy of the proposed amendment on your desk or in your hands. We will now debate the uh, amendment to the bill. Are there any comments or questions on the amendment? Shall the amendment... Uh, Cheryl Van Winslow. So, I, I do apologize, Chair. I was hoping uh, the amendment was being made. So, this is differing than the original definitions. I don't know if... Like, I guess, how does the definition change in this then? I don't know if I'm asking this to the promoter of the amendment or if I'm asking this to the... Is the, how is the definition changed? I'm sorry, Chair. You're asking me a question? Uh, oh, I'm asking <laughs> it through. I gotta tell you, I didn't bring the bill. <laughs> I, I'm asking it through you, and I don't know if the question goes to the promoter. Oh, the question goes promoter to the Promoter of the amendment or to the, the table? The question goes to the promoter. Okay. Yes. Unless you're seeking clarification from... I'm not yeah. speaking, I'm not seeking clarification. I'm, I'm asking how the definition, how you came to the definition or how the definition is changed in the promoters from the original definition. The, the clarification is that uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. Is that this it is largely the same? Absolutely, but the substantive change is that it includes the the phrase least intrusive or restrictive. Um, I think it's sub C. Yes, it is least restrictive and intrusive, um, which is present in some, as Nicholas said, some other jurisdictions, and it just makes it clear in the purpose, which is the sort of what sets the context for the bill, um, what, what we're trying to achieve here, which, you know, which is basically that um, folks who are apprehended under an involuntary um, or, or admitted involuntarily because of a mental health uh, crisis uh, don't hurt themselves or others um, and, that, and that they don't get worse. And we're, this amendment says that we do that in a way which is the least intrusive and least restrictive. I, although Nicola would probably give a much more succinct and accurate description of what this change would mean. I don't know if Charlton Winslow. I don't know if our stranger on the floor wants to give a more substantive. Well, I haven't had the benefit of having enough time to obviously assess this, but there is a difference between protecting rights of persons apprehended and provide for the rights of persons apprehended. So they're, they're, they're saying different things and without having the benefit of time to analyze it. Um, yeah, that's... Thank you. Are there any other questions on the amendment? Cheryl Town West Royalty. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going through it too. Um, so if they're saying different things, is that concerning? We're talking about the purpose here. I just don't want to rush this too, too much. Um, we want to get the purpose right. Um, it, if you're asking me, I think the way we have it drafted, it's been drafted, it's been, you know, we've been working on it for the better part of 20 months, it consulted, assessed, reassessed, and we've stayed with it. You've got to remember a proposive statement doesn't appear in every statute. In fact, it's only in the last few years I've even done them. I certainly don't do it very often. It's intended to act as a summary and a guide to the reader. That's the purpose there. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring any powers, rights, obligations, or anything. It is a summary. And Cheryl Tanwash Royalty? Sorry. No, and that's, that's good, yeah, to provide for the rights, as you said, to provide for a person's rights apprehended, to provide, to, to uh, when you say, like, provide or to care for, to, are we, are, is that a word to get hung up on, provide? I mean, in purpose, like, to provide for people's rights, don't they always have the rights? Oh, okay, I'll ask, yeah. I'll ask, the, I'll ask the mover of the amendment. Protect the strong. Yeah. Yeah. New Haven, Sorry. Rocky Point. Thank you. I should say this was taken verbatim from the Newfoundland bill, which was recently um, recently amended. Uh, and I, I did note the change in wording. I'm not sure exactly in law whether that has any substantive, uh, what, what uh, whether there are any ramifications for that or not. Like I've said, you know, the way we've drafted it is based on protecting rights, not providing for rights. The Charter provides for rights. We're protecting them here. So I see that distinction right off the bat. Cheryl, how much royalty? 
Um, and so what, what I'm looking at the purpose here, and the purpose A talks about um, care and supervision of a person with mental health disorders who require care and treatment of a psychiatric facility or community treatment. But in, in, the other, in this other one, I, am I missing it? I don't see that. That, that might, yeah. that might, will that cause That's problems as we, as we debate the bill? later on because I, I'm trying to get around um, whether a person needs to be in a facility and, and looking at the, the community treatment component that's specific to this act. Um, does the mover want to talk about how, how are we going to make sure that we, we keep that distinction in the purpose? New Haven Rocky Point would like to address that. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, Cheryl Cheryl West Rose. West Rose. Sure, thanks. Um, so in, in the in the unamended purpose, yep. A, it has um, psychiatric facility or community treatment. Mm -hmm. And that seems like if it's the number A in the purpose, it seems like that's where the act will go. Um, but I don't see it, I don't see that kind of language um, in the amended purpose. Um, do you think, I guess I'm in between asking the mover, do you think that uh, we need to potentially amend the amendment to include that or will that take away from uh, where we are so honorable members I appreciate sometimes that the uh, geography of the room is difficult but you'll come oh. speak to your mic come through the chair and then I will uh, redirect your question or comment if the other member chooses to address it so thank you, thank you. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point do you wish to address that yes thank you I appreciate the clarification uh, Charlottetown West Royalty uh, I don't think it, uh, it, the original specifies two particular places and we'll get to community treatment orders later, I know, when we debate the bill. Um, this amendment does not specify um, either a psychiatric facility or community treatment, um, but I, I don't think in any way that, I don't think it causes a restriction, but I'll, de I'll defer to Nicola on that. <laughs> you're, you're, are you asking Nicola Sorry, about your um, yeah, amendment? No, I can't. Uh, I, I, that's my opinion. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Nicola is and is very well versed in, um, in legislation, particularly. Nicola, would you like to address that? Well, when I look at our Clause A, which says to provide for the treatment, care, and supervision of persons with a mental disorder who require care and treatment in a psychiatric facility or community treatment. It's very specific. Um, the clause A in the amendment is to provide for the treatment, care, and supervision of a person with a mental disorder that is likely to result in dangerous behavior, which is something we do not use in our legislation, or in a substantial or physical deterioration, which is, there's a grammatical error there, or serious physical impairment. It, doesn't specify, you know, we're very particular about requiring care and treatment in a psychiatric facility or community treatment. So uh, what's happening here, in my view, is we're taking something, admittedly, it's a cut and paste for another piece of legislation using terms we don't use and omitting concepts that we do use. So it's, in my view, if you're asking me, is it a good fit and an accurate fit? No, it's not. Thank you, Nicola. Can I move on? Uh, Rustico Elmer. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to make sense of this amendment as well, and um, I, I think I understand where the mover of the amendment is coming from um, in terms of making sure that uh, the way I see it is that you want to expand it to make sure it's protecting people, like it says in A, who have dangerous behavior or, or um, what will have physical deterioration, deterioration or serious physical impairment. So I just wanted to clarify, because it was just brought up a minute ago, but did, this is a copy and paste from the Newfoundland legislation. Uh, uh, Chair? New Haven, Rocky Point, would you like to address that? Uh, I understand it is perhaps not verbatim, as I think that's what I said a, a moment ago. Uh, we looked at several pieces of legislation, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and, and other places. So this could, it's, it, it, this could be from more than one jurisdiction. All right. Rustico Emerald. So, um, 
Uh, and Chair, I, I know that uh, the member from New Haven Rocky Point um, had, had already spoke about uh, wanting to examine this further at Standing Committee. Um, the sort of, of analysis that this is going to require of this amendment is something that is going to be difficult to do on the, on the floor of the legislature with the amendment just coming forward right now. And um, I just wanted to make that comment and I'll leave it there for now. All right, I've exhausted my list. Shall the amendment carry? No. All right, members, the amendment has been defeated. So we'll go back to debating uh, the bill again. Section two purposes. I've exhausted my list. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 3, Minister Responsible for Administration. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Section 4, Application to Court. Shall the section carry? Uh, sorry, Charlton West Royalty? Yes. And, um, just to go, and I appreciate the, the, the um, conversation about other jurisdictions, and I guess this is where we would find the where it says the judge may order a peace officer or other person. Um, so other, other jurisdictions have police officers. We're having a police officer or other. Can you talk to me about um, how the judge, if the judge sees that, does, does, does he lean towards a peace officer or other, or how, how does he come to that notion? So with all due respect, I can't put myself in. No. But if it was me, you know, I would imagine, I would anticipate that a judge would be looking at the facts of the case. You know, is this a, you know, a 75-year-old lady who may be suffering from some apparent mental disorder that refusing to go in for any kind of assessment? Um, so under those circumstances, who may be required to apprehend them would be different than if it was, you know, somebody younger, more virile and burly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it would be done in a contextual case-by-case mm -hmm. case yeah. basis. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. you know, and, and when I say contextual, you know, looking at, at the circumstances is what I mean, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cheryl Royalty? No, and the only reason I ask that is because this is the line that I know many people talk about that would be would be difficult when they say other people um, or other person um, if you're talking to somebody who's uh, marginalized or racialized I don't know I don't know how that that happens if it, if it, there, there's no real assurance that um, you know based on what they need or if there's a newcomer to the country and they 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 don't look like like us I mean and, and then we're we're sitting there, it's, it's a very traumatic experience. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming so from. So there were discussions, if I recall correctly, because it's a long time ago, um, where Dante had raised this. And I encouraged him um, to reach out. To, you know, like we as a government, as employees of the government, have taken ongoing training on sensitivity training and, you know, urged um, that, that it, this be looked at for the courts and the judiciary and, you know, to certainly help them in, in appreciating different perspectives. They may already get that kind of training. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I thought that that would be a worthwhile exercise. But, you know, we we defer to our to our, our, judicial, our judicial officials um, mm -hmm. in a number of instances um, to make the, the best determination they can with, based on the circumstances mm -hmm. that are presented to them. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Tanway Charlotte? And I just want to, like, if, if we pass this in here, um, you know, I'm not, I don't want to hold up sections, I, I, I mean, but can we, just as the final, is there any way that we can um, chair, go back and consult with the anti-racism uh, officer just to make sure that we bring this line to him and make sure that it's it's okay. Can we hold it for, we're going to be here de debating this for a couple of days. Is that a possibility that we can make sure that, that we just check with him a final time? Um, check with him for? 
Well, Cheryl, Tamara, Cheryl. I, I would just like to see if the if the if the I know it's it's been there um, and this this has been out for consultation, but I want to make sure we get this right. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that there is. It, and again, for the reasons I've given you earlier, we put peace officer in there for a reason. It was mm -hmm. very deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, because the other individuals that you suggested may be more appropriate, may not be the best equipped in certain situations. We do have anticipated there may be individuals other than peace officers doing this, it says, or other person. Again, consistent with every other jurisdiction in the country. Um, you know, there were several back and forths with Dante on a number of issues. Um, I don't know what more I can say to provide you with assurances that, you know, we, we have done a lot of consultation on this particular provision. Um, as I noted yesterday, we have made amendments from diverse perspectives elsewhere in this bill. Um, we we did encourage them to reach out to the judiciary to ensure that they had had adequate sensitive sensitivity training and whether or not they'd need a refresher or whatever. You know, I think yeah. we've done... I don't know what more I can do, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Cheryl Tamworth, Cheryl? And, and um, I, I, know that, I know that you would have, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, just, just make sure that while it's on here that I... I do that, and, and um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just, again, I, I, I just worry about that, given a case of something happening around, around this that was traumatizing for the community in the, in the past. So, um, I, I, um, I don't know, um, before we have, we have, we have held sections, I guess, um, it might be nothing, but I guess that would be my request chair that we could hold this section and come back to it um, and continue on with this just for till the next available time potentially the next day so uh, I could put to the to the committee yeah that's or if the minister wants. so uh, committee the uh, members asking uh, to hold this section and move on is there uh, an appetite to hold this section on until, and your request is until the minister checks with who? Um, the, well, the, the, in the Premier's office, there's a, there's a member that, that's supposed to be consulted on legislation, which I think was, but it was a long time ago. And that's apparently, I've heard that language a long time ago. So can we check with, with him and uh, see if, if he can be abreast with that? This section and this, this line is on the floor, and if he, if he is okay with it till hey, tomorrow. I'm sorry, I'm just clarify, you're saying him in the Premier's office. Could you refer to yeah, him? Yeah, uh, Dante Bazaar. And he's anti-racism anti manager. And you said you have checked with manager. him. Yeah. yeah. But you feel it's not recent enough? I don't. I, I feel like So it's the not member recent. has asked if we could hold this uh, this clause until uh, they check again. But this isn't passing the bill, and you can bring forward uh, an amendment at any time of the section if you choose to. So that just because the section passed doesn't prohibit you from going back to amend it later. You're not satisfied with your okay. just yeah. Yeah. I don't really care one way or another. Bill won't get passed with I just need to, to find a majority. Do do you want to hold the section? Do you want to vote on this section? Vote. Vote. Okay. It sounds like I've got majority. Do I have anybody? So we're going to vote on this section. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to uh, section four? Shall the section carry? Section five, apprehension by peace officer without order. So the se carry. section carry? Shall the section carry? Thank you. Uh, section six, duty of peace officer or other person on apprehension. <coughs> New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I have one question on this, and it's uh, during the apprehension of an involuntary patient. Um, again, it's going back to that uh, least intrusive, restri restrictive approach. It's not mentioned specifically here. It is at other parts of the act, and I'm wondering why there was a choice not to include it here. Um, peace officers are well versed and instructed on how to uh, utilize uh, least intrusive um, 
at least intrusive method when, when bringing somebody uh, under apprehension. They do it every day, you know, they do it as a regular part of their, their work. So we didn't feel it was needed to add to this particular part. Okay, that's the only question I had. Shall the section carry? Right. Section seven, involuntary medical ex examination. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, so what rights do a patient have when they've been detained <coughs> involuntarily for assessment? Uh, can, you know, can they make phone calls? Can they um, send correspondence to family or friends? They have, as set out in subsection two, they have the um, uh, right to tell them where they've been taken and why, the reasons for their detention, and their right to retain and instruct legal counsel without delay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So does that mean that things like making a phone call or requesting to see a family friend or is, are, are they prohibited? Well, these are what their rights are. Um, if it's a phone call to uh, instruct, retain and instruct legal counsel, then absolutely they'd be allowed to do it. Yeah. Um, and and it also says in sub A, inform the person and where requested by the person or required by law a representative. So if they want family or a guardian or whatever to be informed, that's the requirement there. They have to inform them and if required uh, or requested or required by law representative. And the difference there is the person, the individual, and this is a result of the feedback from the Foyt Commissioner's Office, that um, if I was taken in for detained, I may not want, um, if I have no legal guardian, I may not want my family to know where I am and where I've been taken. So that's why it has to be requested by me. It's required if I have a guardian, a court-appointed guardian. So that's the distinction between those, that, within that provision. Okay. Chair? Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. So, um, When somebody has a psychotic break, for example, um, their ability to, um, which is you know, behind, obviously, the, the rationale for an involuntary admission, um, the expectation that, that they individually will be in a position where they can request somebody is, is certainly not always a given. And I guess my, I'm just trying to picture a scenario uh, when somebody, and as you rightly say, Nicola, they may not want their family, but they may on, they may desperately want or need their spouse, their father, their mother, their, you know, somebody there. Do they have the right to uh, make a phone call? I guess that, that's, all, that's all I'm saying. When people are arrested for criminal offences, they have a right to make a phone call. They have, it's, it's, they have the right to contact counsel. Yeah. yeah. But, Chair. New Haven, Rocky Point. But beyond that, um, calling, call a friend. Not, well, not possible. Again, um, inform. So, if they want, if an individual here wants, um, wants my family notified, then it says inform the person and where requested by the person, a representative right. of the person. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Chair. New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, so. There are, um, in other jurisdictions, there are positions called a rights advisor, mm -hmm. um, where somebody, it's their responsibility to meet with um, a patient or their substitute decision maker to ensure that they fully understand what their rights are. Now, I, I, I know that, that written here we have, um, that somebody will, will be informed of that. In other jurisdictions, that specific individual um, it would be called upon each time an involuntary admission occurs to make sure that it is somebody who knows exactly what a patient's rights are and that they are fully and clearly uh, communicated to the patient. Can you tell us why a rights advisor is not part of our draft legislation here? Yeah. Um, so rights advisors are employment positions. Um, 
and we in this jurisdiction do not um, include employment positions in our legislation as a general rule. Um, so, for example, my position isn't legislated. Um, your position probably isn't legislated. You know, we do not legislate employee positions. Um, we do have an obligation, I'm just looking for the section, imposed upon the administrator of an institution to um, advise, so it would be up to the administrator whom they would hire um, to uh, inform uh, patient uh, shall ensure and respect the patient is informed of their rights in a language informed the patient understands and notice of the f of rights are prominently displayed throughout the institution. So again, we simply do not legislate employment positions in this jurisdiction. Chair. New Haven Rocky Point. Uh, I, and I, pre I appreciate that. Yeah. I remember having this discussion during our briefing yeah. uh, on Monday and I, I just felt it was important for me to flesh it out a little bit yep. and also to have that in the record because other jurisdictions will appoint somebody within government, I'm not talking about creating a new position here, but appoint somebody within government whose job it is to do that. Um, and you're just saying that here, uh, traditionally and typically, we do not do that as a, as a jurisdiction. Okay. I don't have any more questions on section Shall seven. the section carry? Great. Section eight, duty to inform. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. Oh. Section 8, Referral for Involuntary Psychiatric Assessment. Sure. Carry, carry. Shall the section carry? Sure. Section 9, Voluntary Admission. Sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. So this is a lengthy section and, and it deals uh, with voluntary patients. Um, but after clause one, it reads to me, sorry, I just have to flip the page. It reads to me like the patient is actually uh, being treated more like an involuntary patient. If, if a patient is being detained against their will, then um, would that not automatically make them, by definition, an <coughs> involuntary patient? Well, what subsection two says, so you have to remember most... Uh, most patients will, um, most people requiring hospital treatment for mental disorders are voluntarily admitted to hospital, just like people yep. with other issues, yep. okay? So if I'm admitted and I'm thinking I'm doing fine, it's time to go, there may be a difference of opinion. And if there's that difference of opinion, so as it says in sub two, where I've requested to be discharged, if there's now that difference of opinion, then the psychiatrist can issue an order if they think I have a mental disorder and I'm likely to cause harm to myself or others or likely to suffer deterioration and I refuse or unable to, con you know, to continue on with my treatment, then it becomes an involuntary admission. Mm. New Haven Rocky Point? Yes, I, I guess that's the... That's the crux of it for me, Nicola, is that somebody can voluntarily be admitted to hospital yep. um, and then on the, you know, based on, on the analysis of, a, of the um, psychiatrist, presumably, or the, the expert, yep. um, that voluntary admission can become an involuntary admission. Is that, is, just for my own interest, yep. is that something that happens often? Well, I know I've, I've seen it throughout the legislation and all the other jurisdictions. I can't speak to it clinically right. because okay. I, I just wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, that would that would be a conversation to be had with the psychiatrists. You know, the frequency of that, I, I don't know, okay. but I do know the majority of people who are admitted for mental health issues go so on a voluntary basis. New Haven Rocky Point. So, as you said, from clause two right through to the the end of clause seven, um, it, does the process or the the, the rights of, of that individual who initially went in voluntarily, are they, is that assessment any different from an involuntary admission? No. It's exactly no. the same. Yeah. So what they do is they, if, if the psychiatrist thinks that they've got mental disorder significant enough to require psychiatric treatment, um, then 
it goes on to say once he signed that order, it's enough. It's it's enough um, authority to keep them and continue on doing the assessment, going through the assessment process, and then of course the the rights come into it again. Why you're being now? Why we're be detaining you again? You're no longer voluntary. Um, and then it's also, um, so what, what they will do is they'll detain you for an assessment, right? If I want to get out, and then he says, I think you're doing this, I'm going to assess you. At the end of that 72-hour assessment, they've got three choices, right? They've got, they're going to admit me, they're going to issue a community treatment order if I qualify for one, or they discharge me. So it's very much the, sim the same as an involuntary patient. Mm -hmm. New Haven, Rocky Point, and uh, just for my own, uh, my own benefit, Nicola, and that that is consistent with other jurisdictions. Oh yes, of very much so. She yeah. can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm good for the section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 10, involuntary admission. Chair. New Haven, Rocky Point, and I'm, I. I I've mentioned this phrase, least restrictive intrusive, many times already, but under the approach of the least in, intrusive restrictive, should we note that the, an individual is not suitable for a voluntary admission? That's, that's the way it appears in some other legislation. No. New Haven Rocky Point? I'm sorry, I, mi I missed the uh, no. answer. No. No. Okay. Was, so again, was that a choice? You just feel in the same way that when I brought it up in the purpose, you just feel it's not necessary to include that in this section? That's correct. Okay. okay. All right. I, that's all I have for this section. Shall the section carry? Okay. Section 11, psychiatric assessment of an involuntary patient. Check. New Haven, Rocky Point. Uh, section 11, sub 8. Sorry, I just myself have to get to the right page here, Chair. Right. Uh, so th this is where somebody, um, the third certificate of renewal, it's when somebody has been admitted involuntarily, um, repeatedly, in, in our case twice, and then on their third uh, involuntary um, Incarceration. Renewal. Not the right Renewal. Word. <laughs> right, thank you. Please. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's an there's an automatic review. In other jurisdictions, that happens sometimes on the first occasion, sometimes after one. Um, and I'm wondering why we wait until the third time before that review is done. That's been what we've done historically. It's it's always been that way. And in some jurisdictions, so the the renew this renewal, so you've got uh, 60, uh, so they, so to be clear, every time this is this is an automatic renewal. It's deemed to renew every time there's a certificate of renewal. There can be an application for review. Hmm. This is this is what this is doing is deeming to apply. So they may not they have the opportunity to apply for review, but they may not exercise that. So putting this deeming provision in ensures that um, there is periodic reviews by the review board. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you considered uh, whether that that would that. Third time, as you say, it's what we've already, what we've always done here. Yep. That's never, for me, in any uh, a really satisfactory uh, rationale for continuing to do something. And in other jurisdictions, they will do that again after the second uh, renewal, or sometimes at, at the very first admission. And I'm wondering whether you considered re reducing that from the third time. I, I'm not. Uh... 100% convinced that the other jurisdictions deem it. They may make the opportunity available, but That's they may not deem it. A deem means it's an automatic renewal, a review. Deeming is, it, it means it's an automatic review to the review board. Right. There's a distinction there, right? I do get that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, In fact, the, that really protects the interests of the patient, right? Okay. 
To Haven Rocky Point? Uh, so shall be deemed to uh, have applied to the review board. In practice, who, who actually would make that application to the review board? Um, let's check. And it's sub-8. Yeah, uh, the, invo the involuntary patient. So, so sorry. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they may not be capable, of course. Yeah. They're an involuntary yeah. patient. That's so. right. So it, it could be the, um, the patient themselves. It could be their, um, let me just double check. So it could be their representative. Uh, yeah, it could be the patient themselves or their representative that would uh, apply, and that is further back. I'm just looking for the right section. Yeah, so if you go to, uh, yeah, as section 26.1, it's in there. A voluntary patient or an involuntary patient or a representative may apply to the review board in the form required by the review board for review of the following is applicable. A certificate of involuntary admission or a renewal issued in respect to the patient. It's right there. New Haven Rocky Point, do you have any extra? Thank you. Sorry, Chair. I'm just I'm just reading through that section, mm -hmm. which is a fair bit ahead. Yeah, I just it. Uh, if if the onus is on the patient and there there is an involuntary admission, yeah. I'm you know but, I'm sure you recognize yeah. the, the the issue with that. Yeah. Uh, and I do see that it's a, or a representative. Yeah. And again, this I, I would come back to the, the who. Yeah, the who who would who would be helping the patient um, understand that they could have a representative to represent them at this point in time. Well, that would be the the navigators. Again, the administrator. Remember, the administrator yep. has the right, has the obligation to inform them of their rights. Yep. Yeah. And that administrator is, you know, like perhaps the busiest person in the in the yeah. department. And I'm, I'm again, I come back to, I guess, what I was asking earlier, whether we we need to appoint a rights advisor. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe that's an intra-department conversation to be had. I'm just concerned that somebody is not going to be given the opportunity to um, well, make that know. appeal. I saw a statistic, and I think there were like 37 or 38 applications for review. Um, I can't remember what the year was, but I did see there were some numbers. So they're, they're certainly happening. Okay. Yeah. Right. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks. So that, that was on Prince Edward Island, Nicola, presumably. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm good for the section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Section 12, transfer between facilities. Shall the section carry? Section 13, transfer involuntary patient to another jurisdiction. New Haven, Rocky Point. Obviously a, a, a topical topic. Um, and I... Uh, I see there's a change in the current legislation is that the minister no longer has the ability to approve the transfer of patients from another jurisdiction to Prince Edward Island. I'm wondering, if, if, am I right in reading it that way, first That's of correct. all? Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. So this is a real, uh, I'm wondering what the rationale was for the minister um, giving up that right. So this was part of our modernization. And you'll see when we put out the consultation, what, 14, 15 months ago, whenever we put it out last summer, it was already drafted this way, just saying, okay? Um, and so in, for example, Manitoba, it's the Director of Psychiatric Services, Saskatchewan, or sorry, New Brunswick, it's the Executive Director of Psychiatric Services, Nova Scotia, the Director of the Psychiatric Facility, Newfoundland, it's the Psychiatrist. These are clinical and legal decisions, not political ones. And 100%. Yeah, that's why the change was made. And like I say, you will see from the early consultation draft, it was done that long ago. 
New Haven Rocky Point? Sure, and I, I appreciate the explanation, yeah. Nicola, and agree 100 percent these yeah. have to be clinical decisions. Yeah. But we see all the time in legislation the minister shall, yeah. and it's not in, you know, in practice, in essence, it's, we all know it's not the minister yeah. who's made that decision. It's, yeah. it's based on advice that comes from people who are experts Making in that those field. Making decisions, yeah. So who, now, so who now will be given that uh, responsibility? The attending psychiatrist. New Haven Rocky Which Point. Thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm going to make this relevant to the instance that we're that we we both know mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about here. Um, if if somebody is uh, an advocate for a patient who is involuntarily um, being ha uh, being uh, in, in another province. That individual n knew who to contact. In this case, it was the minister. It was very clear. I'm, I'm going to contact the minister and advocate on, on my family member's <coughs> behalf um, in order, because this, this right that you have and, and was used just very recently. Um, in the future, I can imagine an a similar instance where that person may not know who I should be advocating to. Um, you're saying it would be a psychiatrist that would that would make the decision. Um, would the public, and again, I'm trying to make this real based on the situation we've just had here, um, would the public, how, how would somebody in the public know that that's the case and how would they make that happen? Well. The, the attending psychiatrist is a defined term, and that is the psychiatrist who is responsible for the care and treatment of a patient in a psychiatric facility. So, sorry, a psychiatrist, so that's with respect to transferring somebody out. So that would be that patient psychiatrist who is going to make that determination. So it's pretty obvious who, who is making that clinical decision. So, for example, um, my daughter comes to visit from Newfoundland, has some issues, she's put in into a psychiatric facility. Her doctor makes the determination that it's more appropriate for her to be relocated to Newfoundland. Her attending psychiatrist would make that clinical decision and coordinate with the folks in Newfoundland. This says a psychiatrist, in terms of bringing somebody into the province, yep. a psychiatrist may authorize in writing the treatment of an involuntary patient in another jurisdiction coming into here. So it would, it would be a psychiatrist at Health PEI that would make that decision. So there would have to be a reach out from the other jurisdiction to this jurisdiction. Um, and it would go into the, the director, and again, it's an employment position, so we don't put it in there, but it would go into Dr. Salaberia, and, and the connection would be made there. All right. Yeah. Chair? New Haven, Rocky Point. And as I understand it, Nicola, that's exactly the way that, that this transpired here. And I, again, I'm just looking for clarity and um, simplicity for folks who may be in you know, a very traumatic situation to know that if they were to contact the minister, presumably if the same thing had happened in this case, you would have sought input Send from... Them. They, yeah. they would be sent over to the clinical, the clinical side. And the clinical side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Just a final thought on this on this particular clause because it's so, it's so relevant. Um, when uh, you mentioned, Nicola, that quite rightly, that it's a clinical decision that has to be made. Um, but we've changed this legislation to take that right away, at least in writing, or the, that power away from the minister. Is that something we can expect to see in other pieces of provincial jurisdiction here, where the, the minister shall will be replaced with a, uh, somebody who's more appropriate for that? I'm just frantically going through the legislation that I'm responsible for. Not necessarily in the in health and wellness, but perhaps in other departments. To be honest, you I'm not well that. versed in the yeah. other areas. Okay. I mean, this is my area of focus, as you know. Um, I, I do know there's, and without 
spilling the beans. I am aware of some dated legislation whereby a lot of, in my view, inappropriate responsibility is placed on the ministry to do things that they could never actually do, um, and which I fully intend to address before I retire and, and make it right. You know, put the onus where the onus needs to be and the responsibility where the responsibility needs to be. Chair, I'm sorry, I, I interjected without going through you there. My no, it's apologies. okay. And I'm assuming that line of questioning is leading to this bill somehow. Now you're asking about other legislation that has that phrase in it. Well, no, I'm just I'll, fi I'll finish with a comment then, Chair, on this. That um, you know, we we talked earlier about the tradition, the legislative traditions of Prince Edward Island and how we're upholding them in a number of places throughout this Act. And this just seemed out of line with that, but I'm I'm not <laughs> disagreeing with yeah. you, and I've never done a comparative analysis. But I it strikes me that a lot of the legislation here provides ministerial authority where it should be placed elsewhere. So I just wanted to say I'm not disagreeing at all, Nicola, and I appreciate the work you're doing on this. Thank you. I'm I'm good with this section. Show the section, Kerry. Section 14, admission under other legislation. Show the section, Kerry. No. no. That's no. Section okay. 18. Okay. Sorry. Uh, section 15. Authorized leave. Carry. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 16. Communication rights. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 17. Determination of capacity. Carry. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 18, issuance of community treatment order. New Haven, Rocky Point. Um, so, uh, just as a sort of opener, we um, this is a, a new a new facility that we're going to create here on Prince Edward Island, and uh, a, one that I welcome um, enormously. And I'm wondering whether you can explain, um, first of all, what it, just for the benefit of everyone, what, what a community treatment order is and, and how that's new for, for Prince Edward Island. So, um, a really bad analogy, and a few of you would have heard this. Bad analogy, but I think it really helps explain things for people. I personally see CTOs as the equivalent of parole. So you're no longer going to be institutionalized. You're going to be moved into a community setting, but you're not free. You have terms and conditions and restrictions placed upon you, and you're required to abide by those terms and conditions and restrictions until such time as they are removed. And if you don't abide by the terms and conditions and restrictions, there are, I don't want to say consequences, but, but then we have a problem. Unlike role, um, we do um, kind of treat it a little gently initially. If you look in Section 21, you know, non-compliance, um, the, the psychiatrist is, is to ensure that reasonable efforts are made to inform the person and their decision maker of their non-compliance. Um, inform them of steps that may be taken um, and provide reasonable assistance to help them comply with it. So, um, yeah, it's a little friendlier than the other option, but and, and the purpose of a community treatment order is to allow um, somebody, a lot of people will do better um, in the community appropriately supported than they will in a psychiatric facility. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. And I, I, thank you, Nicola, for that. Um, and again, I, I welcome CTOs here in, into, our, into our jurisdiction. It's a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to have added to the arsenal of the supports that we have. And I'm wondering if you can explain why a patient has to be admitted twice and for a total of at least 30 days before they would qualify for a CTO? So there was a great deal of discussion at a clinical level with this, and we take 
in terms of this legislation, we've, we've spent a lot of time with the clinicians on this. And so we did take a look across the country. And um, the pendulum kind of goes from one end to the other. At one end is New Brunswick, and at the other, I would say, would be Nova Scotia. And we've sort of landed somewhere in the middle, okay? We are, um, Alberta has, you've got to be, so let me, let me just par um, phrase this with, when we discussed it with our psychiatry team, they're the ones who came in with the 30-day recommendation. And their thought was 30 days gives them sufficient time to evaluate individuals in terms of severity of their mental disorder. And that's where we get into the, the substantial and the serious criteria. And that's what they're, they're looking at and trying to determine. And they, they don't want to quote Dr. Salaberia, they don't want CTOs slapped on people in a willy-nilly fashion. They want them to be done with the appropriate um, assessment of individuals and, and, and you know, they, they, want, they want to set people up for success. That's their absolute mm -hmm. goal, is yep. to set these individuals up for success. And they're cognizant that they're balancing the individual's personal rights and liberties along with public safety and taking into account, um, you know, what's, what's appropriate in the circumstances. So as I said, we've got um, Nova Scotia at one uh, end of the spectrum. They're admitted for 60 days or longer in the previous two years. We've got um, uh, Alberta and Ontario. It's a 30-day period, a 30-day assessment period, which is what we've come in with. Um, Saskatchewan is admitted uh, at least on one occasion in the previous two years. Um, Newfoundland is within the previous two years has been detained on three or more occasions. So there's variations, right? And then, um, then there's New Brunswick at the far end of the spectrum, and there's no requirement, um, no evaluation period, and and they're out of sync with everybody. They're they're definitely an outlier. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And I, I again, I appreciate your clear explanation there, Nicola. And the concern that I have with the, with the restrictions that we have in, in this draft are that, let's take New Brunswick as, the, as you describe them, the outlier. Um, the, it, it does not mean automatically that somebody will get a CTO. Um, but it, it, but it, it, it allows that facility to happen. The, when, when you start to place restrictions on that, in our case, two 30-day um, admissions. No, it's a total of at least 30 days. There's a difference there, a pretty big two difference. Two more separate occasions. New Haven, Rocky Point? Yeah. Okay, what, whatever those restrictions are. Um, it means that even somebody who might be appropriate for a CTO early on, and that, of course, will be placed on clinical judgment, and I'm not at all suggesting that we remove that. Um, and I'm wondering why you're, you're saying that you found the sort of middle of the pack, if I can put it that way. What, what are the disadvantages, and I would trust our psychiatrists not to be issuing CTOs willy-nilly, as you put it. Um, why would we not make, give them as much flexibility to do their job as, as, as they're able to do and, and go with the New Brunswick model? It was, the, it was the clinicians themselves that requested the 30 days mm. because they were concerned. Um, they, they were, of, in their professional opinion, it would require 30 days to do an appropriate assessment. And, you know, I mean, as you say, we have to respect them. Um, and if that's what they're, they're recommending um, and coming in at, then I respect that. 
Honorable members, I'm just going to cede the floor to uh, Cheryl Tan Winslow for recognition of guests. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate it. And uh, give me a chance to welcome her on the first day of the sitting. She was here, Bethany Collicott McNabb, who is a, a, district, or a resident of District 10, Charlottetown Winslow, and loves the legislature and, of course, loves the debate that's going on. So thank you very much for coming, Bethany, and thank you, Chair. Um, Honourable Member, one more, and then I'll move on and then come back to you, if that's okay. May I also recognize Bethany Collicott McNabb? I, I, you snuck in there and I didn't know. It's lovely to see you, Bethany. Um, so the restrictions that the draft bill currently places on psychiatrists here are that the, the patient must have, within the previous two years, been admitted as an involuntary patient on two or more separate occasions. So this must be, at the very minimum, their third admission involuntarily, and then we've got the 30 days. Well, hang on. No. So they don't have to be admitted on the third term for a third period, if you read it, admitted for at least 30 days on two or more occasions in the previous two years. So when they're in, if they're brought in for an assessment, if you remember back in the involuntary, yep. yeah, the involuntary assessment, there were three options a psychiatrist had at that point was to admit them to a facility, discharge them or issue a CTO. So they would not necessarily have to be admitted for a third time. Right. Oh, do you have a yeah, follow-up? Okay, I'll, I'll follow up. Okay, oh, yeah. with uh, that. Cheryl Tan Belvedere. I think you took my question, but I'll just clarify. It's not necessarily the restrictions that's being that are being placed. It's more due diligence on, on the psychiatrist's part of, of wanting the two admissions with uh, a cumulative of 30 days, is that correct? They feel that that would be the minimum amount of time required to do a fulsome assessment. Okay, thank you. I had the same question that the Honourable Member had, so I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, I appreciate you correcting me, uh, absolutely. Uh, in order to qualify for a CTO, if somebody uh, were to come in, uh, they would, however, have had to have had two previous admissions. involuntary admissions. Right. So we're that that's uh, that does place, and I, I hear you saying that the psychiatrists themselves yeah. asked for this, and you mentioned that you felt that 30 days was required in order to do a proper assessment. But really, that's that's irrelevant here because the the 30 days is not to give them time to do an assessment when this patient comes in for this mythical third time, but that they have been admitted for uh, a total time of at least 30 days. So this isn't in order to do an assessment. There must, must be some other rationale why they felt they could not do, offer a CTO, let's, for, let's say, on the second instance. Yeah. Now, uh, what they indicated to us was these to do a fulsome assessment to, again, it's a, a big part of it is a public safety issue. Sure. Also, the, you know, the patient safety. Absolutely. Um, and in order to do that, it cannot be rushed, and it needs a fulsome period of time. And, you know, originally we were sitting at 60 days, the same as Nova Scotia. And, and the initial, my very first draft was 60 days. Um, because we looked at what Nova Scotia had provided and, and after much discussion uh, and consultation with them, they came down to the 30 and felt that they could do the appropriate, you know, undertake the appropriate evaluations within the 30-day period. So again, you know, I'm deferring to the subject matter experts. I don't purport to, to know better than the psychiatrists, you yeah. know. New Haven, Rocky Point? Sure, and certainly I, yeah. I don't either. Just, I'm just looking at other jurisdictions yeah. and the, as you absolutely said, the, the wide spectrum of ways of dealing with this. And I'm, um, I have an example here of a, a you know, person who's experienced their very first episode of psychosis, it's, and it's severe enough to require a prolonged involuntary admission. They, they could not be placed on a CTO and PEI, even if they lacked any appreciation of the need to follow up with mental, mental health supports afterwards. Um, and and to continue treatment after discharge. However, in New Brunswick, uh, if, um, that would not be true. A, a person could be issued a CTO after that first involuntary admission. Let's say they've been there for 60 days. And, and 
assuming the the assessment was done, whether it was in this province or another, and they in New Brunswick they could be issued as CTO. Here they cannot because they haven't met those criteria. Yeah. I just again I'm I'm struggling to understand why we're placing those sorts of clinical restrictions on psychiatrists. I, I, I don't well, get we're it. not placing them on psychiatrists. The legislation they requested is. it. And I think there's a big difference there. And just because New Brunswick yeah. hasn't um, put in the requirement doesn't mean that they're issuing them without, you know, an appropriate period of, of assessment, right? I mean, they could be keeping people in there for longer before they issue them. So, again, we deferred to the experts in the field when they asked for that period of time. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what more I can say to you. That's the rationale for why it's in the legislation. Because those that are going to be issuing them felt that, that was the, those were the appropriate, the terms they used were markers and mileposts. So. New Haven, Rock Chair, understanding how this may go, I'm going to present an amendment. Um, I realize that there's a spectrum of opinion in the psychiatric community yeah. on this, and you have gone with what you've been Our advised community. here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, an amendment to Section 8, Sub 1, Chair, that I would like to read. Section 18? Section 18, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Bill 28 is amended by the deletion of Proposed Clause 18.1, Sub A, and the substitution of the following. <coughs> A, the person is a patient or former patient who was admitted to a psychiatric facility or, in the opinion of the psychiatrist, has a pattern of behavior while living in the community that demonstrates that, because of a serious mental illness, the person is likely to cause serious harm to himself or herself or to another person or to suffer substantial <coughs> mental or physical deterioration. Essentially, Chair, what it does is remove the... Um, the requirements that, the, that we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes. All right, members, there is a, an amendment on the floor. The pages will pass that amendment out to everybody. Is there anybody uh, that would like to speak to the amendment while that's being passed out, or we can wait as well? New Haven Rocky oh, Point. Just to fill the, the gap here. Um, this, this just doesn't come out of the blue. This was, um, and the, the, the transfer that we were just talking about was from Ontario to Prince Edward Island, and this, this amendment came on advice that we got from psychiatrists in Ontario. Um, just, I just want the House to know that this was not something that was thought up on the fourth floor. Of the Coles. Charlottetown mm -hmm. Belvedere. Sorry, Chair. Go. Miss Fire. Just give it a couple more uh, seconds here for people to digest the amendment. All right, members, is there any discussion on the amendment? Rustico Elmrose. Well, thanks, Chair, and uh, looking at the amendment, and I, I guess it's, uh, it's being more specific um, to stating that a person is likely to cause serious harm to him or herself or to another person. And that's, that seems to be the main difference here, which, I mean, my, my gut feel is I like that because it uh, it seems to expand the definition to allow more people to get help who'd be in that situation. But I, I was wondering if that was the in, intention, Chair, of, uh, of the amendment. New Haven Rocky Point, would you like to clarify? Yes. yes okay. No, thanks. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. New Haven Rocky Point. I could that. Basically, yeah. it, it gives the authority to the psychiatrist. As Nicola has said, however, the psychiatrists and here have, at least some of them have suggested otherwise. 
or that they, they would not be supportive of this change. Is there any more discussion on the amendment, honorable members? Shall the amendment carry? Carry. Yeah. All right, members, the amendment has been defeated. Pardon? Oh, it just takes one to, to vote that amendment? It's a majority. majority. Is that a majority? Yep. I, don't, I only heard one person. All right, there's a, a request to have a, a show of hands. All those voting uh, in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. All those voting against the amendment, show of hands. Yeah, just confirming. Thank you for confirming. Yep, the amendment has been defeated. Uh, we'll now continue on section 18, New Haven Rocky Point. I have one more minute, but I, I have a, a couple of more questions. Uh, the first one is why why can a CTO only be in effect up to six months, Nicola? Um, that's the standard across the country. There's one outlier. Again, it's something that's infringing on an individual's rights. And um, it's not out of, you know, when you think about the timing that we have on, uh, bear with me here, yellow piece of paper. Uh, lost my sheet of paper, but anyway, um, here we go. So, You've got to remember we're infringing on somebody's charter yeah. rights. So we want yeah. continual review and oversight. Yeah. So when we have, you know, people involuntarily detained, it's, you know, on a fairly regular basis. It's uh, uh, 30 days, 30 days, 90 days, 90 days. And so the CTOs um, we're doing every six months. Um, and again, consistent. Uh, Alberta, six months, uh, Saskatchewan, six months, Ontario, six months, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Um, we're in line with everybody else, and it's just to ensure that everything's... It, it makes the psychiatrists, it brings their, you know, they have to ensure that things are that the individual is still doing well, um, that the public is still being protected. You know, it's not a matter of just signing it and forgetting about it for a year. Right. Yeah. So that's why. Okay. And, and it would allow, you know, if, as people improve in the community, it may allow for adjustments in either the plan, uh, in the community treatment plan. There may be, you know, different, different things put in and adjustments made. Okay. Uh, that, that's fine. I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 19, Amendment of Community Treatment Plan. Shall the section carry? Section 20, Renewal of Community Treatment Order. Shall the section carry? Section 21, Non Compliance. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. So, under this section, a patient with a CTO is found not to be in compliance. Is there, uh, is there an option for the psychiatrist to amend or alter the CTO to make it more uh, easier or more, um, more reasonable for the patient to comply? Um, well, we can always amend the community treatment plan, which is in section 19. Um, so there's always the ability to do that. Um, if they think it's appropriate. But at the end of the day, um, if somebody's um, not complying, it may, it may end up that the, the, the order itself, and it says in 22 in the next section, despite reasonable efforts, the person does not comply. Um, you know, they may think, they may feel that, they, that it's appropriate to have that order revoked. So there's, there is always an opportunity to revise the plan, which is forms part of the order. Sure. And if that's not going to work, then the next step may be to revoke the order. Okay. Yeah. Chair? New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. So 
if a patient with a CTO is admitted into a facility, does that automatically bring an end to the CTO? By force of law. And there's okay. one outlier, and you okay. know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Okay, all right. Um, because I scan that as well. But it is by force of law. When you think about it, you can't be incarcerated and on parole at the same time. You can't be in jail and on parole at the same time. Right. Yeah, same thing. However, New Haven, Rocky sorry, Point. I think, uh, maybe the outlier, maybe we were thinking of a different outlier here, Nicola, <laughs> because Ontario amended their legislation. Is that the province no, you're thinking of? It's New Brunswick. Okay, so Ontario amended their legislation yeah. to allow for a CTO to be continued yeah. after recall, even, yeah. if, even if the patient is admitted to the hospital. Yeah. So there's at least two so of them. So Ontario, it says... Um, so 33 sub 3, 4 and 33 sub 4, 5. After assessment on recall, the doctor can admit and issue another CTO or release the patient. It implies that the existing CP CTO is terminated upon recall. But by, by law, by force of law, again, I say to you, you can't be in jail and on parole at the same time. It makes no sense. Mm. And you will find inconsistencies in laws. You do. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Because I'm not going to be put in an awkward position here. <laughs> Fine. Uh, I'm good with Section 21. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Cheryl Van Winslow. No, sorry. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 22, order for psychiatric assessment. Shall the section carry? Section 23. Uh, how do you say that? Revocation. Revocation of community treatment order. So the section carry? Section 24, limits on liability of responsible psychiatrist. So the section carry? Section 25, the review board. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. The first question is why the chairperson has to be a lawyer. Um, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> it's always been that way. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. You probably haven't liked some of my questions Carter, either, Nicholas. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. New Haven, Rocky Point? Okay. So for the two persons who are not lawyers or psychiatrists, um, in other provinces like Newfoundland, they specifically, um, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling for the wording here, but they, the preference is for folks who, who have been um, uh, consumers of mental health, if I can put it that way. But we, we don't have that here. We've got... Uh, Sorry? Sorry? Consumers in... Consumers oh, are you of talking about health. composition of the board? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. I'm Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we have two people who are not lawyers or psychiatrists, and I'm wondering whether we should, as other provinces have done, given priority be to people who are indeed okay. consumed, who have been through this. So, so um, there were a number of questions raised about the composition of the board, and what we settled on was um, individuals who are appointed to the board shall have knowledge, experience, or a diverse perspective. Right. Um, and so that, from our perspective, would allow for um, minority groups, um, you know, any, any number of individuals, not necessarily just people with lived, as, as you, your caucus was referring to, lived experiences, right? Um, it could be, you know, from an ethnic group, from a religious group, it could be, you know, any number of people. We didn't want to hem our, ourselves in. And I, I did encourage, again, Dante to um, help us um, because these are appointed by Lieutenant Governor and Council, so it will be their policies that will determine right. what the criteria are. Right. Um, and uh, I did incur, you know, say that happy to work with you on developing some kind of policy as, as to the individuals you'd be looking for. So that commitment was made, and I'm absolutely convinced he'll hold our feet to the fire on that one. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. So the composition, as um, 
in the draft here is we'll have to, there'll be two psychiatrists and two lawyers, um, and uh, two others who will be um, members of the community. But there's nothing there to specify. And I know many people who have been through serious mental health challenges in their lives, but are extraordinary contributors to our community here. And I think the perspective of somebody who has had to go through an involuntary admission, for example, would be a really valuable thing to have on a review board, somebody who truly empathizes and understands what it's like to be put in that position. And I'm wondering why we don't specifically state um, experience or knowledge with the mental health system in, in this section. So this is the engaged PEI process. Right, where the public applies. And there's no guarantee that people with a particular perspective is going to apply. So we don't, we can't legislatively hem it in, right? You know, somebody with, as you, as you're, you, the Green Caucus, was, or the Third Party Caucus was referring to as lived experiences, there's no guarantee that somebody with lived experiences is going to apply. So we just want, we, we absolutely left the door wide open. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. And I, again, I, I know in other, uh, and I, I get what you're saying, Nicola, that you can't mandate that we have this, the, the, these particular. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. But but you can give preference to, or you or you can, um, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find the Newfoundland version here. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, this, is the, this is the composition of the board in Newfoundland. Four persons, each of whom. No. No is neither a member of the Law Society of Newfoundland and Labrador nor a physician, and each of whom expresses an interest in mental health issues with preference being given to a person who or has been a consumer of mental health services. So they're not mandating that that be there, but they're suggesting that there's great value in having somebody, and we just, we don't have that here, and I'm wondering yeah. what, so why. So I guess part of the difficulty I would have with that particular dis definition is defining who has been a consumer of mental health services, right? Uh, uh, well, there's a... New Haven, Rocky Point? Yeah, it's the, completely subjective, right? It is. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah. You know, anyway. the, we, we know who who has... Or, I mean, if they were willing to, to make it public, we know who has accessed mental health supports. A large portion of the population, as we well know, I think one in four people during their lifetime will access mental health support. So um, I, 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 I'm not suggesting that we mandate that they, that they um, voluntarily give that information, but I, th I think it's not subjective. I, 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 I think that people we know who has uh, anyway, my point is... I mean, I, I could go to my nurse practitioner and say, gee, you know, I'm just so upset and so depressed. And she might say, well, I'll send you to a social worker for a couple of sessions. And I go, so does that make me a consumer of mental health services versus that. somebody that has been on a CTO for, you know, for a year kind of thing? I, I just think it leaves it... I, I think it, we were quite happy... Um, to settle on the diverse perspective um, requirement that would give us the ability to, again, not force people to come forward and say, yes, I've had a lived experience and I want to apply. Um, it just leaves it open to people from a variety of communities to apply and bring their perspective to the board. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. I mean, I... I I, I don't think I've, I personally have used the word the words lived experience at all, and I'm looking at the definition that you have here in, in the Act, which is, you know, in situations like this, knowledge, experience, or a diverse perspective. Those are all, those are all, they carry a certain amount of vagueness as well. So I, 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 I guess I, I would just like to see a, a, more of an emphasis placed, and I think we can do that without restricting ourselves. Um, an emphasis on on people who have received services um, being on that review board because I think that is a unique perspective that that nobody else has and a very valuable one when it comes to reviewing people with CTOs. Again, the only the only other comment I would offer, um, with all due respect, is I do know because I 
do prepare um, requests for people to be both appointed to agencies, boards, and commissions. And we, we do not get a lot of, um, sometimes it's very difficult to recruit individuals to some of these positions. So if you put something like that in there, then we're hemmed in. And if we don't have people come forward, um, then your hands are tied. That's, that's, that's part of the issue. Uh, one more, then I'll move on to sure. else. I'll, I'll, I'll just make it a, a, a comment. I, I, I respectfully disagree. We'll just have to okay. a, agree to disagree on that. I, I think the wording of the Newfoundland thing clearly does not hem us in at all. It just says with a preference to. It's not mm -hmm. saying we have to. So I, I think that we could have made a stronger attempt to have, again, people with, with experience within the mental health system as part of the review board and I think there would be great value in that. Anyway, I'll, 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 we'll just have to agree to disagree, I guess, Nicola. Charlton, what's your Is there anybody on the review board now of colour? I, I don't know. I, I don't know who's on that board right now. Charlton, what's your We don't have any, um, we don't have very many black lawyers. Don't know if we have many People of color or psychiatrists. A couple. There's a couple, I think. Um, I'm just trying to say is that. So then we have, if we want to diversify our boards, and that's what we've set a mandate to. Um, two other persons who are not lawyers or psychiatrists. When I read number two, again, a uh, person appointed to the review board shall have knowledge, experience, or a diverse perspective. We're talking about the Mental Health Act. The word perspective would be in terms of the Mental Health Act. That's how I took it, a diverse perspective with mental health concerns. Is that how that reads? I, I wouldn't have read it that way. I think it would, the way I would read it would, I mean, we don't talk about knowledge of the, of the mental health system. We don't talk about experience with the mental health system. Um, I, would, I would just, the way I interpret this is, you know, somebody that's got a, a broad view uh, or, a, or a diverse perspective. Um, and, and it's not just, to be clear, it's not just the two other persons. It's any person, a person appointed. So it could be any one of the, the seven appointed. All seven of them, sorry, should have, should be bringing something to the table is how that is set up. Cheryl Tanwish Royalty? I guess I, I mean I, I I think I I asked this question when we were we were getting the brief and I I just I just didn't understand because this is an opportunity um, when we're reviewing it that we do need diversity or we do need people to look at this a little bit differently um, and I just I don't see it I see a a, a a weak attempt here but I don't see it being a strong attempt. Um, When you, when you base the word, is, is this based on, is this based on the old review board, correct? The wording of this? No, that's new wording, to try and encompass diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, no, that was deliberately put in there. And that was put in there to, um, after some feedback from Dante. Can I see the feedback? Uh, do you guys have that? No, uh, I don't. Can you? But it was. Sure, it was thank you. Thank it was emailed. It was emailed to to you. Okay. Oh. Can Can you bring that Cheryl, back? Can I you? Thank you, sorry, Chair. That's no, okay. Um, can we see what uh, what that feedback was? Yeah. Some more. Um, just remind those at the table when you're answering the question if you could verbalize it. Just sometimes oh, yes, the answer won't pick up the, the nods or the assumed yes. Charlton, what's your Sorry. That's over. So, sorry. All right. And, and, and the three years, what, what's the process? Um, so if somebody leaves the board in three years, um, then that's a nominated process. All, all of these people go, it would go back to Engage PI? Yeah. These are appointments that are made at pleasure. And uh, yeah, so when we're the obviously the lawyers, good standing of the law society, 
there's there's not a big pool there. Um, there's not a big pool of psychiatrists, but the other two would be through Engage PEI. But again, subclause two or subsection two applies to all appointees. Cheryl Town, uh, West Royalty. And that that's good, but then again, we don't have any, we don't have very many black lawyers, and we don't have very many psychiatrists. So I'm just looking at it. I look at things in a different kind of lens, yeah. I guess. So, um, yeah. And so after three years, after three years, uh, the term is up. Um, can you talk to me about that? Probably. Well, you've got a three-year term, um, and then under the Interpretation Act, um, you can continue to sit until you're either reappointed or your replacement is reappointed, and that's what at ple appointments at pleasure do. Okay. Charlton, I'll show you one more, and then okay. I can move on. Was there any? Was there any? Um, was there any uh, talk about looking at that? Um, you know. Uh, Making it uh, like a maximum of three years or a maximum of two years or any any type of. I think they, well, when I think of the appointments I make under regulated health, they're three-year appointments. Mm -hmm. um, I know the current mental health act; they're three-year appointments. I think I can't. I can only speak to what I know, right? Yeah. So I can tell yeah, you, sure. I do a fair number of them, and they're three-year appointments. Uh, Leader of the third party. I'm just going to jump in here and the time's going to end. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to go back to, to the same point that um, um, the, the two members that were just t speaking to. You know, if this is trying to increase diversity, a diverse perspective does not mean diversity. That's, a va that's even vaguer than preference given to consumers of mental health services because who, who would determine that, you know? And I think w the example that you gave, Nicola, was perfect, you know, somebody who has gone to a social worker a couple of times, someone who's had a community treatment order. They have been consumers of mental health. That is a concrete thing. Whereas a diverse perspective, knowledge, experience, like, what does that mean? what kind of knowledge or experience, you know, that, that seems vaguer to me than if we were to say consumer. Because I think it's really, really important that we have, as you say, the diversity in there and also that we have the lived experience of people who have suffered um, mental health, whether that be in, to our judgment, to be very minimal or to be very, you know, to, that it had significant life impacts. I, I just think it's, that this is really, an important piece. Uh, is that, I mean, there's no, you're not asking me a question. Well, I, I guess. making a comment. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, thank you, members. Um, we are going to now uh, report progress as the uh, allocated time is up. No, no, I know. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. Thank you, Nicole. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be in titular of the Mental Health Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Sure. Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, now I'd like to call Motion 27 to the floor. <coughs> Shall it carry? Carry.
Motion 27. The member for Summerside Wilmot moves, seconded by the member for Borden King Cora, the following motion. Whereas most islanders aspire to live safely in neighborhoods and communities. And whereas increasingly many islanders are struggling to meet that aspiration due to the presence of illegal drug houses in their communities. And whereas these illegal drug houses have a negative impact on the quality of life of residents. And whereas, despite the best efforts of law enforcement agencies, certain legal obstacles which exist sometimes prevent these illegal drug houses from being effectively dealt with. And whereas in other jurisdictions, legislative tools such as safe communities and neighborhoods legislation has been utilized to help better address these challenges. Therefore, be it resolved, the Legislative Assembly work collaboratively with all levels of government and law enforcement agencies to explore further ways to protect island communities from negative spin-offs as the result of illegal drug trade operations within their neighborhoods and communities. And therefore, be it further resolved that this assembly encourage the government to explore the feasibility of developing additional tools such as safe communities and neighborhoods legislation. <coughs> the Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm glad to be able to rise and move this motion around building safer communities. The roots of this motion came from conversations I had going door to door during the election and concerns shared with me around the safety of our community. This motion means a lot to me, as I'm sure you can understand. I've lived in Summerside all my life and I have been proud to represent my neighbours as a member of City Council and now as an MLA for District 21, Summerside Wilmot. Summerside is physically home to roughly 16,000 people and growing by the minute. Even more people call Summerside their home at, in their heart. Summerside has and continues to experience an unfortunate population of people who engage in illicit drug trafficking activity and related drug operations. Now this didn't just happen overnight in Summerside any more than it has in any other island community. What has changed is how lethal the drugs being trafficked now are, the scale of the trafficking happening and its impact on neighborhoods and communities. Fentanyl, hydromorphine, methamphetamine, crack cocaine, these are widely dead, wildly deadly, deadly and dangerous drugs that wreck lives and even can end lives for some tragically. These drugs are having a devastating effect on our families, on our friends, and on our neighbors. This has resulted in a lack of safety and security felt by the people in the city of Summerside. There are neighborhoods plagued by illegal drug houses, trafficking drugs all hours of the day and night. And these illegal drug houses aren't like your mom and dad's bootlegger establishments. These illegal drug houses are peddling dangerous drugs that can kill and wreck neighborhoods. There are parks and recreational spaces that parents do not permit their children to use due to the threat of being exposed to unsafe drug use, exposure to illegal drug operations. It is unfair that people do not feel safe in their communities, in houses they own or rent. The citizens of this province deserve to live freely and enjoy their communities. People should not need to worry about their children interacting or becoming exposed to the dangerous slope of drug activities right in their own backyards. Safety in one's community is one of the most important goals to be met to ensure, ensure the security of all people and to continue to encourage growth in the municipality. Dealing with these illegal drug operations sometimes can pose an extra risk to law enforcement, Madam Speaker. Also, there are legal obstacles to conducting investigations and challenges when it comes to effectively cracking down on the operations in a safe manner. Earlier this fall at a public meeting in Charlottetown, the Chief of Police notes, noted, noted that changes made to federal prosecution guidelines in 2020. The changes, as I understand them, direct Crown attorneys to focus prosecution efforts on trafficking level activity rather than simple possession. The practical effect of that change is that police are running into roadblocks when it comes to enforcement for simple pro possession. That definitely sounds like a problem that needs to be addressed. But Madam Speaker, if the focus of enforcement is supposed to be on the traffickers feeding the problem, then let's make sure that the focus of enforcement measures. And let's make sure that we are giving law enforcement and communities the best tools to get at drug traffickers making this problem worse for islanders. Madam Speaker, our island neighborhoods are not the place for illegal drug trafficking operations. 
That is why I stand here today and urge the government to explore extra tools which we can use to help create safer communities for Islanders. In some communities and provinces, things like safe communities and neighborhoods legislation are used to give communities the law enforcement extra tools to work with. Many provinces and municipal jurisdictions around our country have taken initiative to enact these same types of goals for their problems with drug operations and drug use in the public eye. Safe communities and neighborhoods legislation currently exists in New Brunswick, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, to name a few. Also in our neighboring province of Nova Scotia. They have enacted legislation as well that is similar to this, Madam Speaker. The Safety Safer Communities and Neighborhoods Act of Nova Scotia is a tool that improves community safety by targeting and, if necessary, shutting down residential and commercial buildings and land that are regularly used for illegal activities. That gives, the Act gives citizens the tools to report problem residences and businesses and gives authorities the power to investigate and take action. It also holds property owners accountable for for threatening or disturbing activities regularly taking place on their property. Nova Scotia has a toll-free number for residents to call to report a problem or a property. On Prince Edward Island, this sort of legislation would allow there to be a way for citizens to file complaints and evidence of drug distributions in their community, to then open an investigation and hopefully successfully act against the drug activity that is causing so many people heartache. From Alberta legislation, Safer Communities and Neighborhoods Investigation Units use civil legislation to target properties, not people. This provides a more efficient process in shutting down illegal activities and empowers residents of that community to take back their neighborhood. Ultimately, Safer Communities will lead to more improvements in the health of Islanders and will lessen the probability of violence and injuries in our provincial neighborhoods. This peace of mind is just one of many ways that the government can assure Islanders feel secure to live in their homes free of threat. Laws like this give communities and law enforcement a wider range of tools to help ensure the safety of neighborhoods, particularly when it comes to illegal <coughs> drug houses engaged in trafficking. I think that is something that we should be taking a closer look at for our island residents. It's what they deserve. It is our job, Madam Speaker, to ensure that islanders are safe and content in their own homes and in their neighborhoods. I feel that is an important subject for us to consider, and that's why I brought this motion forward. I look forward to hearing from the other members on this motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. member from Borden Concora. The podium, we could be up here for a while. Get organized. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this is uh, something that's it's quite dear to my heart. It's something that I dealt with starting back in the uh, the early 1980s when I started with Woodstock Police Department. Back, I think the year was 1984. Summer was back then. It's not to date myself, but it was a it was a while back. But I'm very happy to uh, to rise today and speak to this motion in support of motion number 27 and talk about building safer communities. And I know this is something that the honourable member from uh, Summerside Wilmot, it's, it's close to his heart. And I've got a connection to this motion in, in other ways too. And, it, and I, it's, it's, it's the, the Meadow, Meadow Heights subdivision. Uh, my son lives in that subdivision with, uh, with Mary Claire and, and uh, little Violet and Stella. And um, they had quite a time over the last year and a half, two years, when it came to uh, things in that community. You know, Madam Speaker, I remember a time when, when you never had to worry about locking your doors and you left your vehicles unlocked in the driveway and your, your keys were there maybe under the seat or on the sun visor or you left a key for the house underneath the flower pot or maybe even in the mailbox. 
and uh, and that was that was a while back. And I I always get quite frustrated around my house. Um, uh, years ago, when when I'd go to the door and the door would be locked. Why is the door locked? Why are the keys not in my ignition when I want to move the car, or the tractor, or or whatever? But I live in a we live in a time now where the the doors are locked and and the keys aren't in the ignition and and the doors locked or and and then you got to fumble with keys to get it. But with that, we live in a changing time. We live in a time where society has changed and. In some cases, we do not have safe communities in a lot of ways. And that's quite sad to have to say that, but it's a reality. I remember in Halifax, working over there, and, and I've had the pleasure of working in three provinces, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, and, and um, you didn't worry about walking downtown or who you're going to meet at night time and my my Debbie she says to me every once in a while when she's going to work at DVA that um, she's a little bit concerned when she has to park her car and and walk to her office building at six o'clock in the morning or 6 30 and and uh, that plays on me a little bit because um, you know I want to make sure she's safe and, and I want to make sure our kids get to school safe I want to make sure they get home safe but um, I remember the better times when you didn't have to worry about them things. And it's sad to say at the least. But the intent of this motion is to urge government to explore and establish <coughs> tools to combat the rise of unsafe communities for the sake of islanders. And I don't think it's just the sake of islanders. I think it's, it's, it's people across our whole country. It's, it's around the world. We look at what's going on in different parts of the world over in Israel and the Gaza Strip and, and in Ukraine and down in Haiti and, you know, the different things like that. And we have all are living now in a, in a place where, where our communities are in some cases under siege or the lifestyle of good people is being threatened. Everyone in this house can agree that drugs in our communities pose a major risk to our citizens and our neighbors. I think it was a U.S. president that said we are at war. We are at war with the drug trade and the impact that's had around the world. I used to call it the mushroom effect. I remember policing in, when I first came to the island, I, I referred to, to the mushroom effect of, of, from Toronto where you, you saw the rise in crime and, and the drug use and the hardships and the addictions and the lack of supports. And it was a mushroom effect across Canada. And uh, it, it slowly crept from province to province, from city to city. And it's now finally, and it has been for some time, right here in the province of Prince Edward Island, right here in borden Kinkora and right into Somerset Wilmot's area where our granddaughter, my granddaughters live and, and other fine people live that I know. And it's disheartening to me that, that, um, that, uh, that people have to face these type of problems. I've never agreed with giving somebody a shelter at nighttime and not having the supports available for them in the daytime. I, I can remember back when, when we would pick the same people up with the same addiction problems, the same mental health problems, and we would take them to an addiction center or we would take them to the provincial lockup or the detachment lockup and the next morning, we would go and we would release them. And the next night, we would pick them up again. I remember that. And I, it's something that I, I, I don't forget. There's a lot of things I don't forget. Um, and a lot of things that play on my mind and a lot of things that, that, uh, that I've seen over the... Over the you know, I've had a very grateful career from, from the 
dealing with people in the policing world and social services and then in the small business and then now on the political side. But I always try to remember back to what I saw and how can I make it better for tomorrow. And making and having safe communities is one step. And we can all do our part by ensuring that our communities are safe for not only our families, but our friends' families, our neighbors' families, and people that we don't even know and their families. And I think there's a, there's a role in government in that, in a big way. Parents are very weary of sending their children outdoors to parks and to public water areas, to beaches, and anywhere for that matter where they may be threatened or feel threatened or unsafe or insecure because of the improper use of, of things that are happening around them. We have very active drug trade in this province. And I've always, I've never agreed with the federal strategy when it comes to only looking after or only going after or catching the big guy. It's the small guys that are affect, it's the small guys that affect our, our neighborhoods. It's not the big guy in downtown, you know, the, the, the big importer and exporter, they're a problem. But we need to make sure the supports are there for the street level individuals and how they're affecting our community. I will make no bones about it. I have seized unim unimaginable amounts of narcotics over 20 years. And I remember getting calls from the RCMP and, and uh, Department of Justice in Ottawa and saying, why are you targeting the small, why are you going after, the, you should be going after these guys. And I kept on arguing saying, no, that's not going to be the mandate of of our police department, we're going to target the individuals that are directly influencing or affecting our communities and our neighborhoods across the Borden Carlton area and other areas that I've worked in. To heck with you, this is what we're going to do. And we made a difference. We, I believe, that, and I believe that, I believe when I look back in time, you know, we had various people that would would come to our houses, my house, come into the office and Jamie say, you know, we're having a hard time here, I'm having a hard time, can you take me home? Can you take me to addiction center? And, uh, and I've never refused to do that, I never will refuse to do that, because <coughs> I think it makes our community safer. We need to have trust. The, our people with addictions or mental health uh, problems, they need to have trust in the system and they need to know that they're thought of and helped and it can be assisted going forward. And when we make our, we can make our community safe by doing them little actions. It bothers me that in part of this, in part of my notes that I, that I thought about earlier about, you know, it's pretty sad when you, when you're, when your kids are scared to go to a park. It's pretty sad when People go to work and they feel that they 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 might not get there safe, or that they have to worry about you know getting in that door. And I I think that's sad. People have problems. People suffer from addictions. It doesn't mean that they're a bad individual. It means that they need help. It means that they need to be help in the littlest of ways so that they can make their lives better, the people's lives around them better, and our community more safer going forward. Needles and drug paraphernalia are dangerous for all citizens. They're dangerous for our kids, they're dangerous for our, our, our neighbors, they're just, they're, they're dangerous for everybody. And the threat, Madam Speaker, of, of you know, going into a park or going onto a beach and worrying about, you know, getting touched by a needle or 
You know, it's a sad day I remember when I first was issued Kevlar gloves. I still have them. I have a pair of gloves. They were issued to me in the police department, and they're Kevlar. They're made out of bulletproof material, Kevlar, and they're puncture resistant. I still have them gloves. I still have them in one of my jacket pockets. I know that for a fact, because I actually went up to the barn last night to work on the model train set, and I stuck my hands in my brown jacket, and, and uh, there was a pair of gloves in there. I said, what, what gloves are they? And I pulled the glove out, and it was, and it was my Kevlar gloves. And, and I remember walking from there to the barn, and I was thinking about when I got issued them Kevlar gloves back years ago. I remember how many times I would stop a vehicle or search an individual, and you'd never think about it. You'd search the individual, put the hands in the pockets, and, and never worry about getting punctured by a needle or stabbed by something. It was just, you, know, you don't think about that stuff. I remember going to work with a pair of handcuffs and a, and a sidearm. That's all I ever carried. And uh, now you see policemen today, oh, gee, they look like the... The, you know, they've got so many different things on it, from gloves to tasers to weapons to just, just unbelievable. First aid kits, like every, just, it's unbelievable. But it's pretty sad when, so I remember back of, of, of so up to the, going to the barn, I, I, I thought about these Kevlar gloves. I said, my, how society has changed. How has society changed? That, that not only back then that we, we have police officers wearing gloves and, and I say I remember searching vehicles and you stick your hand right between the seats and, and the Honorable Deputy Sergeant Arms, she would remember that. We'd take her hands and you'd be searching a vehicle or something or sticking it underneath the car seat. You never think about it. You just take your hand and you'd ram it under the seat and, and see what's there. You wouldn't now. Wouldn't do it now. You're right, Honorable Member. <laughs> wouldn't do it now. And it, it, it brings me to think about our kids that are out there and our parents that are walking in parks and, and, and the possibility of stepping on a needle or a child picking up a needle and playing with it or, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's sad for me because uh, you don't know what's going to happen. I think education, and I'll, and I'll credit the, you know, the Minister of Education, I, we've had some conversations over the last number of years and uh, and we, 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 we've talked about the introduction of fisheries and aquaculture into our school programs to give them people insight. And we've talked about, with, the, with Tim Garrity, with the elections PEI, we had a great meeting there. And we talked about in teaching our kids about the importance of nonprofit groups and becoming on boards and, and voting and, and uh, becoming involved in politics. Uh, something I've been a big advocate for, for uh, more women in politics, more diverse politics, more, more individuals from diff different ethnic backgrounds uh, in politics. And I think that's something that we, I can say that I'm very proud of as the minister and I were able to, to, to work on that and uh, move that forward into the school system. And I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, but now we're talking, should we be educating our kids in our schools? about drug paraphernalia and the dangers of, of picking them up and finding them. Do we need to go to that level now? Do we need to, the Polar Department of Education staff in and say, you know what, we have these problems out there in the street. Well, maybe we should start giving an introductory course in the Department of Education that if you see this, this, and this, don't go near it, pick up the phone, call somebody, get a teacher, somebody you trust, and say there's something here. Do we need to come up with with, with metal containers. I remember when, back in the SO and I said, why do I need a cigarette container on the side of the SO for somebody to put their bus in? And I remember having to go out and buy containers to go on the sides of, of my Exxon station, my gas stations, for people to put cigarettes in. Do we need to start buying containers now to go on street posts or telephone poles? Better check Maritime Electric first. Um, to, to, so, so that somebody can safely take a needle or drug paraphernalia and put it in the container. What's our next steps to make our communities safer? And it all goes together. When you're talking about safer communities, it, 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 it's safe injection sites in some cases. It's, it's safe facilities to put the, the paraphernalia in. If you find a, a drug or something, do you call your police? Well, I don't agree with calling the police um, because it ties up police resources. But how do we how do we how do we deal with that? But it is on the rise. 
and I think we can all agree that that we need to deal with it. We need to support it. We need to find solutions that help our people in our communities, from our children to our parents, to our neighbors, to our people that are suffering, and people with addiction problems that need help and are asking for help. To start to growing or to solving these ever-growing problem is to tackle it from the roots. And it goes back to what I said about, you know, deal with it on the street level, not on the national level, and provide the support directly to the people that need it. Our residential properties where people gather and engage in drug-related trafficking operations needs to be looked at. And I know the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, um, I know he, he, he totally agrees with safe communities, and I know he's a, he's a great advocate for our police departments and the RCMP, um, but they can't do it alone. We can't operate in silos. We need to make sure that the supports are there for our community, our police officers, and our support services to help everybody. The existence of these locations that happens a lot in various communities. No community is immune to it. Every community is affected by it. And every community is asking for help. Doesn't matter if it's in rural PEI. Doesn't matter if it's downtown Charlottetown. But it has to be for everybody. Madam Speaker, I would encourage all members of this House to support the establishment or the work towards making our community safer for not only our families, our children, people that suffer, and for everybody. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the mover and the seconder of this um, very timely, important motion. That's that's uh, you know it was done on May 12, 2023, and uh, I think uh, much has changed since then. Um, I think the motion building safer communities. It could be started with let's stop destroying communities that needed to be in here right now because that's what's happening and whether or not it's through neglect of what we're doing and not having a vision we're divided as a province and a community especially in this one and First step, I think, is to maybe go back to, you know, how we're trying to divide our, our nation. We have the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Are we that close to that? Maybe the government needs to come over and really start to say sorry to this community before it starts changing its plans, before it starts giving us um, new ideas and new visions to, to solve a problem they have no idea about. And this started a long time ago, it started in this chamber, it started without consultation. It started with for the right intention and purposes, and I, I know the community was behind trying to solve issues around how we deal with, which this motion talks about drugs, um, negative impacts, type of quality of life. Those are just some of the things in this motion. But it starts without listening to the communities. Because I know, you know, I know people down here that, that wanted to help. But every time we ask questions about this, four years ago, I've only been here since the last term, four years ago, and four different ministers of housing and social development. And each one tried to, I mean, we had good meetings and when they got, they got a few things done and they got things here, but they didn't really understand the repercussions of 
of not communicating with the communities? How do you how, how do you buy a facility meant for curling in the middle of a community um, and, and change it into something you don't have any idea what it's going to do or how it's going to help people? And the, the Salvation Army, I mean, they did they did what they could to try to manage this, but they weren't experts. The government needed to be there, and I told you that right here in the, the floor. I said government needs to run something of this nature for three years if we're truly serious about getting people supports and helps because nobody knew, nobody knew what we were getting into. And it's moved five times. This will be the fifth move. So I don't understand when it says building safer communities and the clauses don't really do enough because if I took this motion into the community where you're talking about locking your place at night, now we have to, you can't leave your place unlocked when you're home. You can't let your, your child play on the street. That, that sickening feeling, a lot of us have children here, that sickening feeling when people are playing or when they're outside now, or when they're moving around with their friends. We, we didn't do, we didn't do what we said. We didn't keep our island safe. So to say building, take the verb off. We have to start somewhere else other than building. We talked yesterday about, we talk, or two days ago at the very start, I thought about it, I was like, oh, we're celebrating an enclosed friends around Prince Street School. We have a total friend. Is that keeping the children in or out? How, how, how can they not play? How can they not go and play because they can't get in there? So are we, what are we doing? How can a kid look at, a, look at something through a fence and not be able to go and play because it might not be safe? I don't know. We can do better. And. If you don't understand, I can keep going. I see you shake, shaking your heads at this. I, I'm just getting warmed up. I'm trying to stay calm here. There's no acting here. I've been on this file for a very long time, and the Minister of Environment knows it. You knew this was not a good idea right from the start. He said it's going to be neat. He didn't tell them you were against it. Watch it. Yeah. right there. You didn't even mention a name. <clears throat> the member has the floor. We sat in committee. The committee gave this government multiple recommendations, and you ignored them all. Right from security officers at the community outreach center, right from buying a curling club for 1.4 or 1.5 million, because that's what the representative said. We don't even know. You didn't provide the data of the services the whole way along. It's a pilot program at the very start. That's what you said. Then you changed it to a temporary location. It never stopped being a pilot program because you didn't say it. You never provided us the data. We never knew who we were doing. A simple question would be, how many people have we housed? How many people have we housed from what we're doing in the system? How many people have we transitioned into transitional housing and out of transitional housing? Do you want me to keep going? Poke me a little bit more. I don't care because I know this file and I understand where you and maybe I made mistakes too along the way by not pushing you hard enough. This is about not speaking with the community, not allowing them to engage and support. And they wanted to and they want to support and they want to believe that we can find a solution. But when we're talking about drug houses, in this community, it's way bigger than a drug house, a single two, three, or four drug houses. This is everywhere. You've changed the community so drastically that the police in our own community have said it's an unpoliceable situation. Met with them. The Minister of uh, Public Safety has met with them. I've, met with the police. I've talked to them about this. They're doing their best. They're, they're trying. They, what are they, what are they there, there's so many barriers. There's in there. They can't get people into the academy. They can't get people out of the academy. You're saying, oh, we're going to open a new facility and have six, six police officers. Where are they going to come from? 
It's, it's, it's so hard to do right now. They're working overtime on weekends, the police, to pick up needles. They're, they're, they're trying. They're just not being supported with what is happening over here. There, there are so many things in our community that we need to build safer. And I believe it's a lack of vision and you've created a division within our community. And I hope, and I hope that, that there's, there's still, that you're communicating with the community right now because everybody in Prince Edward Island wants to help. There's, there's just trust factors with, with what we've done or what you've done. I don't care if you blame me or you or whatever. We have to come together. And by right now, you move something or you made an, a conditional announcement to, to, to move something without communicating again. Did you communicate with Park and Beach Street? No, not yet. We're going to go do that after this. We're trying to get the city, city involved in, in, in what we're doing. It is, it is a difficult situation, yes, across everywhere, but we can take care of problems. We should be able to manage and take care of problems better in our communities in Prince Edward Island. I'm just hoping it's not too late and I'm hoping that you, you listen to each other um, and that the ministers come together, I mean, moving housing away and out of social development. Now you're separate, housing and land and communities. Social development doesn't have anything in your mandate letter about solving this problem. And when you say it's a social catastrophe over there, it doesn't make sense. It, it's, it's very disjointed. And uh, communities are, are nervous about this. And I, I, want, I want you to fix the emergency shelter system. I want you to fix the next stage, which is, which is transitional housing which is not um, at its best right now because we're not moving people out of transitional housing to the next step, which is supportive housing. And then after that, we're not being able to provide them supports there, which is the next step, which is low income housing, which we have none of. And then you can move along the next steps to vocational and you can start to work on your life and what you're doing. And that's where the, the community can be there. But we can't fix the first one, we, so we can't move to number two or three. There's people in, in, in our transitional housing system, that's, it's, it's 365 days minus one. They, they've, they've been there for way longer than that because there's nowhere to move to. There's nowhere to go. So they might need help, and the system needs to be there. Mental health supports need to be better. Addiction supports need to be better. So every, every one, there's so many ministers over there I'm looking at, I could probably speak for a half an hour on each of these things. Money is not going to solve this, but planning just might. And you have to do a little bit better than you have. Because if we don't get control of this now, I'm worried. I'm just worried. I'm the critic of a lot of these different things. And you've got to start listening. So as I close, In Summerside, they had one house, one house, and I'm thinking in one house in particular, and the, there was a lot of discussion about this, uh, one house, and it was a, it was a ongoing situation, an escalating situation. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point where people are living in, in a house that has no water, no heat, no nothing, and people are in there by six, seven, eight people for a long period of time. Enforcement wasn't there. Provincial enforcement wasn't there. That's what, that's what I've heard. And I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it just kind of took through the neighborhood. And I think that's what maybe this was about back in May. Um, I've talked about this file. We need to do better. We need to help people. And recently, I think some changes were made. But six people are out. Six people are out of that place. Where are they? I don't know. I hope they have shelter. I hope they have supports. I hope they weren't just put out on the street. I hope that somebody was there to say, hey, can we help you with your life? Are you ready? We can help you. 
And not everybody can always be helped when they, when they need it. But if we're not there when the people who want to change want to change, we're in big trouble. And I'm worried about that. So in our different communities, in that standing committee, I can't wait to see us deliberate and talk about going across the island from Montague um, up to West Prince, Summerside, and Charlottetown. The people got a chance to, to talk and deliberate and, and um, you know, we listened. And you know why that standing committee listened, which is made up of, of all the parties in here? Because I think we wanted to show you how you can listen to, to the communities that you represent. And it's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard and they have a lot to say and they deserve to say it. And I think if you find an approach to that and let people speak and let people have the opportunity to help you, even though I know what pain they're going through and I know and I've heard the stories and I don't like them at all and they, we need to do better, we can stop and we need to listen to them and try to beg them that, to say, hey, you know what? We weren't there from you, they made a lot of mistakes, but we need, to, we need to work together to fix this. So, I don't know, if it's still there, hopefully. So, I'll pass the floor at this time, but there's a lot in this motion. Building safer communities is essential, but I just hope we can, uh, we can do better, and we have to do better because we can't go on with the lack of vision because there's just too much division in Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> um, it's an honour to be able to speak to this motion today, and I want to thank the member from Summerside Wilmot for taking it for forward. <clears throat> I do want to welcome Johnny McDonald to the gallery, who he's been overlooked by your uh, uh, apparent ally over here who's fighting for you but won't even look at you. I know what I will say, what I said to you yesterday, and I'll say it publicly. I watched you when you presented to the committee. I thought you did a really good job articulating yourself. I thought you did a really good job representing yourself and the people around you. And what I want to say is, to you is, I see you and I hear you. And I think others do too. And I think you deserve to hear that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, it, we talk about some of the issues that you, you see around and the, the member from Borden Kinkora talked about how things have changed over time and in, in policing. <clears throat> and uh, it's even changed over time how you, you approach things. I know, <clears throat> as most of you know, I have twins. They just turned three on the weekend. I've had them in here different times while we had events going on. And, and I remember one particular time... Um, I had one more thing to do, and Cheryl was going to take them outside to play in the front lawn out there. And I'm like, no. And she said, why? And I'm like, that's, you don't, you're going to find a needle there. The kids are going to find a needle. I just said, stay away from there. Stay on the concrete, please. And, <clears throat> you know, I realized you deal with that every day. I re realized you deal with that on every street corner. I realized the children who live in that community deal with it. And I realized the urban centers deal with it more than I do. Like, I live in the woods. And that's not to say we don't have problems where I live and that, that we don't have <coughs> similar type problems where, where I live, but uh, there's really a congregation of the problem <coughs> in the cities, in Charlottetown and Summerside, and it's probably because of access to supply, it's probably because that's where people are that can congregate together. I don't really know the reason, I'm not an expert in those things, but <coughs> I, I will say that it's something that concerns me as a, as a parent. <coughs> and. Uh, I have, my oldest son is 23, so I have kids from 23 to three. Um, not, not all through those years, but I have four kids. <coughs> and I'll say, oh, when raising my son who's now 23, these weren't worries. I didn't worry about a park in Charlottetown when we came to Charlottetown. I didn't have to worry about needles on the street or or those types of things. How do you tell a three-year-old, don't pick something up, like something that's shiny or something that has a color on it or something that looks like it's different that they haven't seen before? How do you tell a child not to pick those, those things up? And I think it's a... Um, and that's only the problem from a parent perspective. Like, there's... Every viewpoint towards this issue is different. 
because they have different, different needs, different concerns, and there are different places in their life. Um, you know, I think that when, when Brad McConnell said, <clears throat> you know, that they basically can't charge these people anymore, it was like, wow. Like that's, we need services to help people, yes. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that for a second. And, and I think that, you know, the Minister of Housing has talked about this a lot, and I think the file's in good hands to, to bring it in a direction that, you know, that people can be happy with. But policing, I think, is an important part of it, not being able to police it appropriately because of the federal government is, uh, is quite disappointing. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'll also say this, that this, I brought a bill forward in 2014 that exactly, exactly what you say here, exactly, identical. Introduced it here, the legislature, that legislature over there, brought it to first reading, and the Liberals basically made fun of me for bringing it on. Like, why would you ever need this? Why would you need protection? What do you think's going on? What do you think's going to happen? And it's like, and look, look here, and like nine years later, and, and here we are talking about it again. I'll give you the legislation if you want. You want to look at it. <clears throat> and we thought at the time it was a really good piece of legislation to bring forward that might have protected communities before they got to this, to this point. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, I guess it's easy to cast blame on governments, but there's been a lot of governments here in PEI too. So it's not just, this didn't just happen yesterday. This is something that's been bubbling and boiling for a long time. And uh, taking away tools from the police force certainly no, doesn't help it. <clears throat> um, I think the, the member from Borden King Corps talked about it too, about the, the types of drugs and how hard, how hard the drugs are. And, and really from my own childhood, what I will say is like, the, what was available when I was growing up was, you know, you could probably find a bottle of moonshine. You could easily find a bottle of moonshine. You'd probably find somebody going to the liquor store. We used to stand on the, at the parking lot at the Cardigan Liquor Store and wait for somebody we knew to go in for us, and they would. Like, that was like the 80s. Like That wasn't yesterday. That was a long time ago. But those were the issues of the day. Those were the things that my parents were, were worried about. And, and like I was probably 18 before I saw drugs, and it was hash. Like, and, but that was like, at that time, we were like, where would you find that? Like, where did you, would you even go to get it? And I was 18 years old, and none of my friends would have even really known where to, where to find something like that. And, uh, you know, I don't think I lived <coughs> a sheltered life. We my, you know, I wouldn't say my, my friends and I were wild, but we were from Cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that we... We lived like we lived like the generation before us in Cardigan did. We were, you know, we did our thing. We enjoyed ourselves. And there's a song about that. There is a song about it. We we did. We we enjoyed ourselves. And I just think that when you look at the type of drugs you have to worry about now for for children, it's not even close to those things. If that's all, if if we could go back to the late '80s and have only those, like those things to worry about then we'd be in a, oh, having a whole different conversation here today. There's pr still probably be complaints that we needed more controls on those things, but I mean, to be honest with you, I, I don't know how you ever get out of the, the mess we're in as far as drugs go and the, and, the, and the level of hard drugs that are available. I don't know how you, because it's not just here. You see it, you know, uh, last time I was in Toronto in the summer, if you, if you get off those, the main drag in Toronto, it's bad. If you get off of, even as you go up Young Street, because I stayed way up Young Street, the further up Young Street you, you get, the worse it gets. If you get over around Kensington Market now, it's bad over there. And it never was, I mean, it was probably always bad, but it was never bad as, as I you see it there now. You see it in Halifax, you see it in Moncton, you see it in everywhere you go. So, like, we're not the only... Um, jurisdiction that's being gripped with this problem and struggling with a solution on how to fix it. 
Um, so, I mean, I, I feel for the people in, in housing and the people that, that you work with as partners that have to deal with this. I, I you know, it's, it would be easy for me to say, this is a solution, or this is a solution, or this is a solution. I don't know any solutions. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think we have to work with people. I think that's important. I think it's our job. <coughs> um, I think it's important for us to hear people's concerns and, and accept them. I mean, I've been doing this for, I mean, into my 13th year now of this. And uh, like any other job, sometimes you have to hear things that don't feel good to hear or that, that initially you may not agree with. But over time, if you take it at face value and you take people for what they, what they say, their concern is their concern, and there has to be some avenue for you to try to address it. And that goes for anything that comes my way. I do my best to try to address it. Um, <clears throat> I always say that, you know, when we make a, a decision, probably half the people are going to disagree with the decision that we made. And we have to take the calls on that decision and explain why we made, made the decision and, and do our best to try to give people the comfort that we have the best, the, the best, we have their best uh, interest at heart. I, I always said this about <clears throat> when Robert Gibbs was Premier. Uh, I, we used to have some epic battles in the legislature. My job was to ask him questions, so I get the role of opposition. He was Premier, he was good at answering questions, and he kept me on my toes. And, and what I always said afterwards was, I didn't ever believe there was anybody who came to the Legislative Assembly who didn't want to do the very best they could do for Ireland. <laughs> And I think that, you know, I think that holds true. I don't think there's a, a single person in here who didn't come here to do the very best they could do for, for Islanders. But just like a hockey team, not everybody gets to be Sidney Crosby. Somebody like you folks over there have to be fourth liners. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, but you know, but... <clears throat> Everyone has a job. To, everyone has a role in here. Everyone has a job in here, and everybody has to try to do it to their best, best of their ability. You know, and I think everybody probably wants to be the one putting the puck in the net. But you know, I've had a lot of jobs in this in this legislature. Some of them were tougher than than others. Um, I think that my approach has always been to to be honest and true to myself, to what I told people I would be when I when I got here. And uh, what I will say, and I said this before, I've been elected four times, and I think every time by more votes than the time before. I so I think that, the, well, I mean, I haven't heard you offer a single solution to this problem. I've, I've heard you pander. I just did uh, No, I've heard you pander. Oh. I've heard you pretend that you were in, in favor of these folks that are fighting against it. Uh, not, not to them, but you didn't say it to them. He had a chance at committee. No, you, they were a committee right in front of you. You wouldn't even look them in the eye and say, I'm with you. No, I watched it on TV. I watched it on TV. Not once did you say you supported them. Not once did you even say you heard them. One question. You have to be, look, if you're going to take, be taken seriously in this, you have, you have to get behind something. You have to stand for something. I think that's the problem. I think that's why. I think that's why you guys only got, like, what, 12,000 votes the last election. It's because you won't get behind anything. You won't stand for anything. I think it matters. And I think people are watching. And I think people know that liberalism has caused a lot of issues in this country. Quite frankly, all of them. <laughs> but, <clears throat> well, <laughs> I don't know. I can only speak for me. I can only speak for me. I know who I am. Uh, I know who I am. <clears throat> Anyways, Madam Speaker, what I want to reiterate is, is a couple of things. This is an important motion. I'm glad that it's on the floor debating. I'm glad that it was brought in this respectful manner, that we could have a, a good conversation. I'm, I'm glad that you came with a, a, a solution on, you know, how, how you see us being able to tackle this issue. <clears throat> and I think that at the end of the day, more open discussions about this is what's going to get us to 
the end goal. Pretending that, you know, pretending that this isn't an issue or pretending that it's not an issue because it's not in your backyard doesn't make the issue go away. This issue is going to creep. It's going to creep out of Houston Street into other parts of town, into other parts of the province. It already has creeped into other parts of, parts of the province. <laughs> and quite frankly, I think that we should be the ones having open conversations with Islanders in a very open fashion about, about this. And, uh, you know, I don't think that the time is well used by acting or pretending here. I think the time, you know, I think that the time for that is gone, and I think the time for, for straight talk is here. Be People in this province deserve representation. There's an MLA for that area. The MLA for that area should be the leader of the cause, not Johnny. Not that you're not doing a great job. I think you're doing a fantastic job. But people deserve representation. And anybody who knows my career, I got behind every issue in my district. We fought to keep schools open. We fought against amalgamation. Every time that I was needed in my district, I was right here. We fought to get the shipyard open. We didn't get it open. We didn't win every battle, but every time there was an issue in my district, I brought it here to the floor over and over again, and you can look it up because it's all in record. 12 years of that, where I stood up for my community, over and 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 over again, because that is my job. That is your job. Your job is to defend your community. Your job is to represent the best interest of the community. You know what? I'm not going to knock. I'm going to say the leader of the opposition has done a very good job of that, representing his area. I've, he has. <clears throat> He's been elected for two different parties in, in taking this. It says, no, but it says something about him. It says, it says what people think of him up there, that he's willing to bring their issues to the table here. And I commend the, the member from Summerside. You brought up Summerside issues here in the legislature, and that's what I, I, I commend you for that. That's what people want you to do. People elect you thinking that you're going to be the voice that comes down to Charlottetown and fights for them. I think that's very important to uh, uh, an important part of your job. <clears throat> so as we look at this motion, I ask you to look at my bill from 2014. You can read the answer and see how the Liberals treated me about it. And uh, you can see for yourself how, uh, how things might have been much different if in 2014 it hadn't been treated like such a joke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> The hour has been called. Do we have any notice consent? I don't remember from Kensington Malpeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, what's my line again? <laughs> <laughs> I move seconded by Sori Elmeyer that this House adjourn until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, November 10th. Shall I carry? <laughs> Shall I carry? Shall I carry? Have a good evening.